Ladies and gentlemen, this is Julian Mason from Adrenaline Combatives, and I am here with Mr. Tony Blauer from the Spear System. How are you doing, Tony? I'm good. How are you doing, buddy? Great, great. It worked from the first time. Usually, you know, sometimes we got a bit of technical difficulties, but with you, it was boom, on point. I can see you've been doing that for a while. Uh, yeah, I mean, we've got, I've been on a lot of podcasts, and I have our own podcast like yours. <laughs> Uh, so we've got all the equipment set up and it was just click the link and good to go. Just click the link. Yeah. Uh, that's good stuff. That's good stuff. But I'll tell you what, most people know who you are. I mean, you, you've been talking about certain things that we were all in our pajamas when you were talking about that <laughs> stuff already. Uh, so, but just for those people that might not know who you are, do you want to give us a brief introduction of who you are and what, what you do? What do you do? Yeah. Uh, I, you know, your audience is, is obviously a, a different demographic. I've, I've been on so many different podcasts, so it depends on, is it a business podcast? Is it a family podcast? Is it law enforcement? And I think the I'll people tell that you. follow... What's okay, that? I'll tell you. So I... Yeah, well, no, I, know, I, mean, yeah, I, you, I was going to say that... No, I was going to say we're, we're overlap the, uh, the, over, the overseas. It's like an overseas long-distance call. We're talking over each other. The... Uh, your audience is very is is more hardcore self defense. People into combatives, uh, into realistic uh, training, and so that makes it easier for me. I was just doing a preamble that there's so many things that we do now. After you know, I've been in the industry for over 40 years. Uh, you said some of you were in your pajamas when I was talking. Some of you listening to this weren't even born. Uh, how how old are you, Julian? I'm 36 years old, Tony. So I've been teaching 43 years, right? My, so, my, my father was training with you when he was my age. Are you serious? Yeah, yeah. My, my father was in the French Special Forces and he, was, he, was tra he did a few of your seminars in, uh, in the US. Why? Yes. I didn't know that. <laughs> that's, uh, so <laughs> that's very cool, man. We got to talk about that a little bit more. But background for people who, who don't know uh, who I am, uh, you know, I've been studying violence, fear, and aggression for 43 years. I I grew up fearing fear. I was a very good athlete, but I was afraid of fear, uh, the psychology of fear. I kept wondering, if I'm so good, why am I so scared before this event? That it could be a wrestling match, a tennis match, uh, gymnastics, skiing. So I was this, you know, top-level athlete among my peers, but I never could make it to the podium because of fear. It was the psychology of fear, not the skill. So this became uh, a very, very important part of my journey is trying to understand and separate the difference between the psychology of fear and then the biology or physiology that we feel. Um, mm. my, my first martial art, of course, we didn't realize it at the time was uh, wrestling only since the, you know, the uh, UFC exploded in 1993 and then the subsequent years did, did I think martial arts realize how dangerous and, and uh, formidable people with a strong wrestling background or ground fighting background are. Uh, I love boxing. I got really the boxing. I, I, I boxed in Montreal and trained at the Hilton's boxing, boxing clubs. Uh, these, these guys were, you know, world-class uh, boxers, um, love boxing. And then I, I, I started teaching because I always loved martial arts. I said, of course, Bruce Lee junkie, Bruce Lee fanatic, like many of us. And um, I got asked to teach a 15-year-old kid. Uh, I was 20 at the time. I trained him. And what do we do? I'm training in my, in my, with the best of intentions. I'm teaching him. It's 1980, Julian. I'm teaching him uh, grappling, kicking, and boxing because those are my arts. And, uh, you know, whatever through osmosis influenced Jeet Kune Do had. And well, that sounds like mixed martial arts, right? You, you know, which is what, you know, Jeet Kune Do was in many ways. So uh, I trained him for like three months and he gets his ass kicked in, in this fight with this bully at school. And he's telling me the story and I realized, oh my God, I didn't prepare him. I didn't prepare, I didn't prepare him emotionally or psychologically. I prepared him mm -hmm. as if it was like, hey, I gave your instructions in the changing room, tap gloves, slow and good clean fight. And that's what a lot of us did like in the 80s and 90s, we just thought the fight was going to start what I call like a Star Trek model where you just beam down and you're and you're going. And uh, so I reverse engineered. I asked him what happened exactly. And he started with, well, he hit me with a left hook. 
I go, well, what do you mean he hit Louis? Why didn't you wax on, wax off? Of course, Karate Kid didn't exist back then, so that's a little joke. But, you know, why didn't you parry? Why didn't you check? Why didn't you bob and weave? And he says, well, I was holding my school books in my hand, and I had him in a single arm grab. I grabbed his shirt after he poked me, and I slammed him against the locker bank, and I said, don't ever put your hands on me again. So imagine I walk up to you, Julie, and I got, uh, you know, groceries in my hand, and I grab you with one hand. It doesn't matter what I know, because whatever you do is going to get in, because both my blocking and striking tools are tied up. There's nothing yeah, I can yeah, do. Yeah. And when he explained this to me, I made this, I've told this story a thousand times. It was like the god of self-defense hit me with a lightning bolt, and I went, oh, my God, we teach self-defense wrong. And that mm. day forward, everything became, what's the scenario? What did he do before he did this? Because if we just practice how to get out of headlocks or how to do gun disarms, we're not practicing situational awareness. We're not developing pre-contact cues. We're not discussing verbal tactics or even the most important thing that is, I think, the most overlooked part of every self-defense curriculum is understanding the psychology of fear and your, your self-talk. So mm. fast forward. So that was really the origin story of how I got started kind of uh, uh, reinventing uh, the, our, the, the inter it wasn't my intention at the time to be, to do it around the world. It, I was just taking care of my students, right? It was selfish. I need to make my students self uh, safer. Uh, but that event in 1980, like kickstarted or launched my incubator period. That was the 80s. So in the 80s, I developed the No Fear program. We called it Cerebral Self-Defense. I've I've changed the name mm -hmm. of it. Uh, in the 80s, I discovered the uh, the application of the start of flinch uh, and its relevancy in self-defense. And we pioneered. There's so many people talking about it now. And I, like, I get it. But we pioneered that. Nobody was doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, interestingly, uh, for science, one of the biggest research, probably the biggest research company in the world. Uh, uh, they're uh, they're in the USA for Science Institute run by Dr. Bill Lewinsky. They just released a report on how the startle response could assist police officers in uh, in uh, sudden ambushes in gunfights. And he mm. sent it to me. He said, hey, look, this supports your research. And I, I thanked him. And I said, like, like, I've been saying this for 30 years, like 30 years. And you guys. So some people are just finally catching up, which is kind of exciting. Uh, the incubator period developed the SPEAR system. For those that don't know, it's an acronym for Spontaneous Protection Enabling Accelerated Response. It's the study of our, the human weapon system and how our survival reflex, the startle response, actually bypasses cognition. So if I say to you, Julian, what would you do if a guy thrown an overhand right? Your brain is going to download a bunch of options that you've trained. Those are neural patterns, right? But that's a complex motor skill, right? Whatever mm -hmm. you do, and, and, and here's the interesting thing. If I ask anybody on this call, including you, what would you do? You visualize the event, you visualize the attack, you visualize the counter. It's a theoretical uh, uh, event in the future. So our answer is really a projection. We don't know what we're gonna do because that hasn't happened yet. And the context here is this, if because so, a lot of people don't understand the spear. There's a, a lot of, and this is why I said like this, this will be different because your, your audience is different than I get, I get, I've been on hundreds of podcasts where I'm not talking to like, like fanatical martial artists like you and I are, right? They're not people that, you know, they're like, Hey, I want to go to work. I want to go home. I don't want to get attacked. Uh, how do I learn to protect myself, my family? The, the reality is this, the neuroscience is that if a stimulus gets introduced too quickly, your executive function can be bypassed, which means you can't access your complex motor skills. It's your complex motor skills that drive every block strike interception. You had a move to do. If you're coming in with any of these movements, it's a learned complex motor skill. Whereas if you were like texting me and I went, hey, Julie, look out, you wouldn't, you wouldn't do that. You'd have your phone in your hand. Your movement would be part of it, but it would be actually... Uh, uh, precipitated by the startle response. And it's mm. so the spear system looks at that neuroscience and it says that's going to happen first and it's going to bypass cognition. The caveat where most people are selective listeners and, and they don't they don't do the due diligence to research it is that 
if you've got logical skills that follow up, then what happens is the spear system, like an airbag in a car, becomes a, a bridge to your ability to convert it into something. So the micro flinch might happen here, and then suddenly you're you're driving forward, but you've got to make the connection be, be, between the two. Anyways, uh, I went off on a tangent there. We've got the, the, the 80s developed the spear system. The 80s created the No Fear program, originally called Cerebral Self-Defense, the Mental Edge. And then... The um, the probably one of the biggest, most significant things, and I, I was happy to see a, a picture of it on your on your website uh, when we started doing force on force training. So we were doing like Fight Club before Fight Club was a movie. Once a month, we'd get together, we'd do scenarios, and we'd kick the shit out of each other and and analyze it. Uh, in the original days, I, I lived in Montreal. We would wear hockey gauntlets, hockey uh, 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 helmet, taekwondo chess guard, baseball shin cards. We were dressed like Frankenstein, and I said, "I got, I got, a, I'm going to design a suit one day." It took me five years to design it. Um, it's the high gear suit, and it revolutionized how people do force on force. So that's that's kind of like a a ten minute history of 43 years. And in that time, in 1993, I got discovered by the uh, public safety and law enforcement community decided to close my school uh, and and just devote myself to military and law enforcement training because I'll tell you this frankly and I don't mean to piss anyone off and you can ask me anything on this on our talk about anyone any piece of equipment from the copycats to the wannabes to who's legit I don't give a fuck what we talk about I'm an open book uh, but what I found in the law enforcement military, community or people who actually put their lives on the line, who actually move towards danger. And, you know, everyone else was like, well, I would do this and I do that. And if you remember the the line from the original um, uh, Roadhouse, when they meet Patrick Swayze, one of the guys says, I thought you'd be bigger. You know, and that's been my, my life story is like, oh, who, who, I saw something on Black Belt's uh, page. They posted something about me a couple of months ago. And there were a bunch of guys on there like, who's this old guy? And I was like, you motherfucker, my son's older than you. Shut the fuck up and, and, and go watch one of my videos and learn something. Anyways, so there you are. Open book. <laughs> yeah, man, that's uh, that, them, them suits are pretty cool. I got two of them uh, and they work really well for uh, like force and force, like scenario training, simulations. Uh, really good stuff, man. I like it. Thank you. Um, so I tell you what, I got a list of really cool questions for you. Some of some of them you've already uh, replied to them, which is great. We'll just jump to the next ones. How about I know that one of your thing is mindset. So how about how would you teach the average person to develop the proper mindset, how to work on their confidence and their body language and et cetera, et cetera, uh, to to be a harder target to avoid getting picked on, basically? Yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's so many answers in so many areas that we could go, that we could go into, uh, in mm. general, if, if, uh, you know, if you were a client and you said, how do I improve my mindset? This could be hours of discussion. It, it, and, yeah. and it would start with, it would start with, you know, what is your scenario? And that's the magic mm. thing in the spear system. We say, what's the scenario? Because if I said to you, um, uh, Julian, someone gets you in a headlock, you know what's what's the first thing you're thinking? What are you going to do? Guys, got you in the headlock I there in the first place. Yeah. Okay. So, but now you're in the headlock. What's your what? You know what are your what are your immediate action options? What do you do? Blitz, Counter blitz him any way I can. Yeah. Just get. I mean, it's, it's principle based, but basically grounding myself to avoid going to the floor and blitz him with everything I got. If I got a free hand, I'm I'm going to grab his balls. If I can bite, I'll bite. If I can grab his eyes, I'll grab his eyes. I mean. It'll be principle based right. rather than technical based, but yeah. Yeah, no, and uh, a great answer. But if but if we go back to what's the scenario? If I said, oh, by the way, I entered you in a uh, in a jujitsu tournament on Saturday because you said you wanted to just see what the stress is like and what it's like. Suddenly, yeah. fish hooks, eye gouges, groin gouges. You, you you can't do that. Yeah. So that's what we mean by what's the scenario. So when we talk about mindset, what a lot of people do in 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 nineteen ninety. 394. Well, I was at the very, very first uh, uh, UFC in uh, Colorado, and I was writing for three magazines, uh, Australian magazine, a UK magazine, and uh, USA magazine. 
And I wrote an article that got me a lot of hate. That's something I've become uh, very accustomed to over the years. And if I could, if I could monetize my haters, uh, you wouldn't be able to do a podcast with me because I'd be living in Fiji, you know, in my mansion, uh, not taking calls. Uh, uh, that's a joke, but not very funny. The, um, the, in, my, in the article, Julian, I, I, I said, hey, although these guys are really fighting, this is not the same as a real fight. And the only people that really fight are people who are the protectors in our world. Now, uh, someone who's a citizen can be a protector, a courageous bystander, someone who's, who's trying not to get raped, uh, kidnapped, murdered. Uh, but those are few and far between. The real protectors are law enforcement, public safety, uh, and military, because someone says go here and they run towards the danger. So what I was trying to distinguish here was something that you said, you know, it's got to be principle based. And when you when you uh, invest in a, any one system or not even system, any one methodology, a style, you create a romantic and a dopamine uh, uh, um, uh, what's it, addiction to that. So if you love jujitsu, mm. all problems are solved by taking someone to the ground and choking them out or making them tap. Whereas mm. the safest thing that you could do might be to fucking run. It has nothing to do with how good you are as a grappler. There's mm. a there's a, uh, a seminar I do for martial arts schools, and the title of it is Just Because You Can Doesn't Mean You Should. Mm. And, and what, I, what I highlight in there are four or five legendary martial artists, world-class martial artists, who are all dead now because the predator, the asocial predator who, who uh, they had the altercation with, didn't know who they were or didn't care who they were and pulled out a weapon, a knife or a gun. Mm, so yeah. had that predator said, yeah, let's fight. And the guy said, well, look, and I'm a jujitsu guy. So we're going to fight on the ground. Had the predator said, okay, let's go. He'd have been, he'd have been tied up like a pretzel. Uh, Alex Gong got shot through a car door, you know, chasing down mm. a guy who hit his car. This guy's like, like 4% body fat, world-class Thai boxer, fair text team like if you and i sparred him he would destroy us he's like like the like but he chased the guy down who hit his car banging on his door and the guy shot him through the door because the guy was in a stolen car and he was a piece of shit coward using a gun mm. so it wasn't, you know they didn't clinch right <laughs> and mm. and so there was no like leg checking the bullet it was like holy shit he didn't know that and so and I'm going to get to the, the mindset thing. Whenever somebody hires me, a company, uh, 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 an individual, a martial arts school, everything is bespoke. Everything is custom. And who's our audience and what do they need to know? Because you need to triage education. What do I mean by that is you're a doctor and, and it's a mash unit. And I come in on a gurney and the first thing you see is that my foot's broken and and my you know the bones sticking out of my leg and so you immediately as a as emergency room doctor you go shit i gotta fix that i gotta fix that bone we don't want gangrene we don't want him to lose his leg and you're fixing my bone but you didn't notice that i had a cut on my neck and i was bleeding and so i die on the table because you weren't fixing the most important thing that's triage what's the most what is in the most important thing now to save this person's life so when somebody hires me or my company, we've got trainers all over the world now, is it's like I go, what is the most important thing you guys need right now? Because, for example, I'm 63. I've been teaching 43 years, but I've been training over 50. I started wrestling when I was seven years old. No one, with the exception of a handful of people like you and, and some of the other you know, uh, the people even in, in uh, invited on your show who are who have made their career out of this. But it's we're doing this because we're obsessed. We, we don't we don't take a day off thinking about safety or training or what goes in our body. Uh, mm. We may slip up because we're human, but we're back on it. We're like, you know, like if, if I eat like shit yesterday, I know that I'm hitting a workout today going, dude, you ate so much cake. Holy shit, right? But I know where you look at the rest of the world, everyone's fat and out of shape and everyone's calling 911 because they can't protect themselves. So 
this is like the longest answer ever to what you know the this but i do these rants in our classes i go like if if, if you're in with me you got to fucking hear this shit because i'm going to give you things to think about and do and if you don't do them you're not coachable and so yeah. but if but, but you know in terms of like how does somebody improve mindset one of the things one of the exercises we have people do is identify specifically what will it cost you if you don't fight back? Mm, That's one of our yeah, trademark questions. What will it cost you if you don't fight back? And people don't think about that. And, and so that can inspire uh, uh, a level of indignation. In, indignation is a special type of anger. Uh, and yeah. again, so, some of this, some of these these buzzwords and languages are right out of our our, our instructor course. Um, they're I've, I spent decades refining the language, the nomenclature of the system because words are icons and we mm. need to use powerful words when we're educating people. Sure. So we can go from what, will, like I can be, you know, talking to a mother and she goes, but I'm scared. How do I know this will work? And I say, if somebody was trying to drag your kid off to rape and mm. torture them, what would you, and the mom's going, I'll fucking kill that guy. And I go, well, how did you get your black belt in 30 seconds? Because 30 seconds ago, you said you were afraid. And now when I put your, your kid in danger, you're ready to go. So this is out of our Be Your Own Bodyguard principle. So a light switch happens when we can create that symbiotic bodyguard moment in an individual. But it can also go much more theoretical, Julian. It could be something like, hey, I want you for two days. I want you to watch yourself living. And they go, what do you mean? I want you to watch yourself go to work, go to the ATM, go to the bank, go to the store. And I want you to watch yourself. And every time you're in a paused state in a transitional space, I want you to ask yourself, how would I attack me right now? And I want to, mm. I want to know, what did you learn? Could you, did, did you, you know, did you get in your car? and close the door and look at your phone and you're in a parking lot in a transitional space where a lot of robberies happen, a lot of kidnappings happening because everyone's addicted to their smartphone, which makes them really dumb. And yeah. you realize that moment when your situational awareness is compromised. So it can go from something as emotional as the be your own bodyguard principle to something as, as almost uh, 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 dogmatic as monitor your routine. And if you know mm. that, there's this spot between when you park here and you walk here, that would be, you know, your Thermopylae. That would be your moment where an ambush could be set. That's where yeah. your phone's in your pocket, head on a swivel, and, and you're analyzing things there. Yeah. So those yeah, are two extremes, that, and there's a lot in between. Yeah. That, that, that goes exactly where, where the next question was going, you know, say, how, how do you break down... Uh, the different types of awareness. So if we speak about uh, personal awareness, environmental awareness, situational awareness, per, uh, behavioral awareness, and all the risk assessment, pre-threat cue recognition, and all that stuff, uh, how, how do you break that down for the for the people to learn that stuff? Is that continuous or do you just drop everything as a bomb? You know, so, you know, I hate repeating this, but, I, but I'm going to, you know, there's a formula <laughs> and there's a system and, 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 so, you know, I say this all the time. I've studied violence and fear for over 40 years. Mm. And I've worked with from every acronym agency in the world to, to, you know, I've gone to countries where it's like I'm signing an NDA with their government with respect to who I'm working with. So we've become one of the most trusted resources because we have, we've created almost like Gavin De Becker created a software that could predict uh, um, uh, from for, like who would go from a stalker to a murderer of a president or a celebrity. And he, he, uh, he developed a software decades ago that the Secret Service purchased from him. So there's so that they could look in and, and it would be like an algorithm that would create uh, a predictability factor of should you really take this threat seriously based on all of these components so we've created an algorithm where literally you drop in your scenario your concern and all that and the system will ask you to do certain drills and ask certain questions that spit out your answer there's no way to memorize every counter and every attack 
in every off balance to on balance moment. And this is the big illusion of any type of martial art. And it's, 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 uh, and when I say that people sound, they go, Oh, he's putting me down. He's putting down the art. He thinks his is the best. I'm not, I'm not saying that if you ask me and I've been asked this question before, uh, you know, Oh, you think you'd be able to, I go, I don't know what I do. I know what I think I do, mm. but it takes a very, very interesting level of self-awareness to go. I know what I could do. I don't know what I would do because it hasn't fucking happened yet. Yeah. Right. And so I'll give you a great example. My family had a home invasion, three guys, two of them had guns in the house. I wasn't home. Fucking horrible. 2009, 2010, Virginia Beach. I wasn't there. I had to come home to that. And then I'm mm. debriefing my family. And my 16 year old son, they, they had all moved my family into a closet, which makes it now kidnapping. If you, if, if in a home invasion at gunpoint, you move somebody around, it becomes a kidnapping charge. You're moving them, even if it's in the same, in the same house. Mm. They're all in the closet. They're rummaging through the house. One of the gunmen comes back, opens the door. And he's holding the gun by his hip. And he grabs my wife by the arm. And he says, where's all your money? And she goes, I don't, I don't have any money. I got some cash in my, in my wallet. And she's talking. And, and my son says this to me after. And he probably, he, not probably, they weren't wearing masks, um, which is always bad, home invasion. You can identify people. But yeah. when they forced, when they forced himself in the front door, he was upstairs, 16 years old, watching uh, uh, um, some sports channel. At, at uh, It was around 6 o'clock on a Friday night. He hears the commotion. He dials 911 right away. And the cops were literally there within three, four minutes. It was insane how fast they got there. So these guys before, because the assumption with all the training, you know this, if I asked you, hey, home invasion with masks, home invasion with no masks, what's the probability of executing the people? You go, well, it could happen in both cases, but if they're not trying to conceal their identity, statistically, mm. that's a problem. So yeah, no yeah. masks, but they hear the fire, they, they hear the, the sirens, and they yeah. fuck off, and they bolt. My son after, so like, like this started, and then three, four minutes later, it's done, they're gone. Everyone's freaking out, crying, the cops are there, SWAT team's clearing the house, I get home, there's cops staged on their car with their guns. I'm like, what the fuck? Um, I talk to the family after. My son says this to me, Julian. He's, he's got tears in his eyes. I'm trying to hold back my tears. He says, Dad, I remember what you said that in, in uh, uh, an armed confrontation, that if you need to go for the gun, never be in front of the hole. Expect the first round to go off. And when they grab mom... And they took her. I thought they were going to murder her. And I was going to do that move you taught me of, you know, if the gun's here, gun's here. Gun, like, there's, as you know, there's different things you're going to do depending on, you know, where the gun is or where the weapon is. And he mm. said, I remember, he said, I heard your voice in my head, expect one round to go off. And we we're in a narrow closet. And if I had done that move, that round would have hit one of my sisters who were like uh, uh, seven and 11 years old at the time. He, and he looks at me and he says, I had to let them take mom. I couldn't do the gun disarm because I knew one of my sisters would have been shot because of the angle, the, the way we clear it and, and, and attack the hand. Mm. And I'm mm. like thinking, what fucking courage to not do it and self-awareness to go, I'm not just going to go into the move. I Because my one of my sisters is going to die Mom's going to have to figure this out by himself. And this is what I mean by just because you can do it doesn't mean you should do it. Yeah. This is all mindset. This isn't technique. Um, so when, you know, like every, as you're figuring out very quickly, there are no yes, no answers in my mm. system. It's always what's the scenario? Who's there? What's going on? And I'll give you another example because everyone on here, uh, you know, most most of the people listening, of, of course, are, are I'm assuming interested in self defense. Um, I was hired by uh, a, a a country's RBSD reality based self defense uh, program, and I guys don't hate me when I say this. I, I always um, 
I always make fun of that acronym, reality-based self-defense. What other type of self-defense should you be practicing? It's self-defense is self-defense. Right? It should be like, real. Yeah, we, we, we don't need to say reality-based. Um, <laughs> and I understand, I understand why, you know, why some people say it, but I, I always, I, Hey, I'm 63. Let me be a cantankerous prick. I like making fun. Right. Um, uh, so this, I'm not going to mention the name or the ty- or the style, but it's a very famous RBSD. And I asked them, do you guys teach gun disarms? And they go, they say, yeah. I go, do you guys do scenario training? And they go, yeah. And, and I said, describe some of your stuff. And it's like, okay, the gun's over here, the gun's over here, the gun's over here, the gun's over here. We step in. It's whatever the move is. It's fucking Bruce Lee Chinese connection. I don't give a shit. It's direct. It's our system, clear control counter. I don't care what it is. I said to them, what other nuances do you add to that practice? And they're like, well, what do you mean? And then I shared with them this story with my son. Here's a 16-year-old kid who had practiced these moves because I trained him and then said, I can't do the move because somebody I love is going to die if I do the move. Mm. Holy shit. What a level of maturity for a kid. And I said, the mind navigates the body. There are There is no such thing as muscle memory. That might be a mind shock for a bunch of you. But if you're using the term muscle memory, you can stop. It doesn't exist in the literal sense. It's multi, multi have, memory. It's it, there's no such thing as muscle memory. It's neural. It's neural patterns. Your brain learns patterns, right? You're not going to do a gun disarm and clear a malfunction if you don't learn the neural patterns. I know what people yeah. mean by muscle memory, but as as a researcher and as somebody who who lectures at the highest level, sometimes I need there to be a, a level of 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 accuracy and authenticity and integrity in what in what we say just because you do something ten thousand times doesn't mean you're going to do it ten thousand one times why because executive function can be hijacked by the the proximity of sudden danger you know, i i hate fucking spiders and snakes i was walking down a hill this week i had, I had 10 people in to do private training with me this weekend i'm on a walk the day before the event i told them the story they thought it was hysterical i'm walking down a hill and there's uh, these uh, 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 thick rubber, like, uh, I don't I forget what they're called, um, to prevent when floods happen, when rain happens. Oh. There's these, mm. these, these uh, tire, like tire, pieces of tire rubber uh, on the hill so that you don't get the flooding. And as I'm, mm. I'm walking down a steep hill, and as I'm about to step over, when a fucking snake's head comes out, and I want to explain to everybody that you can flinch backwards while you're stepping down a hill. I was like, whoa, holy shit. You know, but, and this is such a fun thing I love sharing with everybody. You flinched a thousand times in your life, right? Mm. Everyone is, someone goes, hey, you know, fuck man, don't sneak up on me, I almost hit you, right? But we don't recognize the micro flinch where the shoulders come up, the head turns, the eyes close. The thing I need everyone to understand is when you flinch, you never say flinch. Mm. But if you're sparring and you're moving and then you see me, he's stepping in and you're getting ready to parry and do a move, you're visualizing the interception, you're leading it. Like your brain is a hard drive trying to predict the future. But when a stimulus gets introduced too quickly, it attacks you at a survival level. And that's why mm. we always say situational awareness is a conscious cognitive skill. Everyone says head on a swivel, left the bang, blah, blah, blah. All true, except the reality is you can be surprised. And if you don't yeah. understand what the human weapon system will do there, you're going to be behind the curve in recalibrating and catching up. So I'm off on 57 different tangents here, just ranting about the system. Uh, um, I see a bunch of comments on the side there. I don't know if you're tracking them too. I don't know if, people said, are going no, if, they're, if the people are saying like, who is this old guy? Um, but I thought he'd be bigger. Uh, <laughs> oh, anyway, yeah. So, so, so Julian, if there's something interesting there, feel free to drop it in. But I wanted to tell you this group that I was training with, I said this, and this is what I wanted to share with you. I learned my gun disarm. I got a guy who's sticking the gun in my face and I learned all these great gun disarms. I rip it out of his mm-hmm. hand. I break mm-hmm. his finger. I smash him in the face. I shoot him. I kick him. Does your psychology change if your wife and your kid are standing behind you and your gun move is to get off, get the, that little hole away from you 
uh, knowing yeah. that if it's semi-automatic, semi-automatic, and he's got his finger on the trigger, there's a good chance a round's going to go off. So if I've got mm -hmm. uh, school kids behind me or my sister behind me, should I do that move that I got really good at? And the answer is fuck no. Mm -hmm. But I asked this group, I said, does your mindset change? Does the element of fear that you're going to manage change if the gun in front of you, the same, the same counter might be appropriate, but this is a robbery, this is a kidnapping, and I'm starting to execute people in an active shooter and I turn and look at you. In other words, I'm in the right-handed shooter pointing that gun at you. But there were three different psychologies, three different scenarios. All of them mm -hmm. don't necessarily change the move that you need to do, but they change how and when you'll move because of the amount of fear you need to uh, 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 kind of acclimate to or, or counterbalance or, or uh, evaluate. And people don't realize that even the best in the world have – to have fear from Tyson to George St. Pierre to uh, uh, Navy SEALs. The honest ones will tell you, yeah, we we're shitting in our fucking pants there, but we we're professionals and this is what we signed up for. And now this is a chance for us to fucking prove ourselves or do it. You, you had to turn the fear into fuel, which is one of the, the principles of our no fear program. Mm. Yeah, no, that that's great. We'll definitely speak about fear at some point when we get down to that to that. Um, actually, pretty soon. Um, I mean, you know, this this all little questions that I have. I was going to speak about pre-contact cues and personal space management. Like, do you use the term defense? You know, like uh, that that was coined by Jeff Thompson. Like, uh, is that stuff that you teach? It because I see the the spear system. You guys have, uh, uh, you know, kind of have the same sort of stance at the beginning yeah um there's there's an interesting story to that which i'll, I'll tell you offline uh even though i said i would do anything because i really respect jeff um no, he's a great but, guy yeah but, me and but, jeff uh, are, I mean, yeah. but the um you can't control your opponent's behavior yeah. A hundred percent. You can influence it. You can redirect it. You might be getting to, to, you can distract him. You can get somebody to move closer or further away by how you posture and move. But our system of nonviolent postures and what we call the Trojan horse metaphor, and we've got nine different stances that we work on and four classic ones, hands on hips, arms crossed, half negotiator, full negotiator. Yeah. So, so the, as I understand it, and I'm not going to talk on, on Jeff's stuff, the principle of the fence is, you know, it's, it's a proxemics thing. It measures, uh, you can measure him. So, you know, you can hit him if he indexes your hand, if he moves in, that's a tactile mm -hmm. cue. You better start moving. Um, our approach is, is so a lot of stuff, like when we go flinch and we fire the hand and, and our fingers splaying out that, I have people go, oh, you copy that from Penjack Salat. Oh, that's a rising block in this karate style. Oh, we do that in, in Cali. Oh, they, and I'm going like, nobody understands that if I whip something through the screen here, everybody who hasn't trained ever in their life will flinch and their fingers will splay and their hand will come out to, to push away danger. You see it in uh, uh, pictures where a soccer ball sails over a net and, and, yeah. and it's the stands. Everyone does this. You, you see it when there's a, a, a penalty kick uh, or, a, or a, and, and you got all the players there standing there covering their nuts, turning their head, even though they're stress inoculated to this, the, if it looks like the ball is going to hit them, they're like this. And all of a sudden they're like, fuck, right? The head turns. Um, so the non-conscious survival reflex overrides all cognition. The way we manage distance is by understanding what we call the three eyes, instincts, intuition, and intelligence. If I know that, imminent danger is becoming immediate danger why the fuck would i stand there you know i've got to be assessing that why aren't i engaging the threat or disengaging getting the fuck out of dodge um yeah. and, and so like my friend tim larkin mm. we just want good people we want good people to survive sudden violence there's a lot of things that tim teaches that i go i wouldn't do that and there's stuff that i teach that tim goes i wouldn't do that there's stuff that jeff teaches he goes i wouldn't do that 
and there's stuff that he would see me. But our 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 passion and mission is to help good humans survive mm. sudden violence. So the philosophy yeah. is the same. At a certain level, the psychology is the same. It's just our our methodology. You might go, I like hitting people with hammers, and I go, I like hitting people with tomahawks, and I go, well, Julian's an asshole. He likes hammers. Well, it's the same fucking thing. It's just it's just a, a different a different tool. My what I've done that I believe is is worthy of everyone doing legit research on is I've studied the neurobiology of survival like no one else. And mm. and so understanding the human as an operating system at that level, like the, the non-conscious functioning of the, of the stuff. And that's where when we do when we do this move and the arm fires off, it is it is designed to merge with your survival system. Yeah. And that makes the conversion even faster and, and more deliberate. So what a lot of people do is they, they look at the picture and they go, you know, I would just break his fingers, you know, uh, he's got his fingers open. Right. And it, it's silly stuff. They're, they're not doing the research. I, in fact, this group that I was working with this weekend, I tell this story uh, with my friend, Ron Don Vito, Ron Don Vito is a legend in the Marine Corps. He developed the, the Marine Corps line system that was taught for decades. And then when he retired, he moved to Fort Bragg, where he was running uh, the Q course for the for the U.S. Army. And uh, a mutual friend of ours said, hey, you got to meet Ron. Well, I knew he was. We got together and he's a very direct, blunt guy. And he says to me one night, he goes, why are you teaching people to flinch? Why would you do that? Mm. And I said, I'm not teaching anyone to flinch. You already know how to flinch. I'm teaching people how to weaponize the flinch. Yeah. And, and, but it was four hours before he got it. It was four. And this guy is like, I mean, he's a fucking killer, both like with kinetic shit and his hands, you know, Marine Corps, 20 years, gunnery mm. sergeant, like fucking cr like crazy experience. But it took me, still took me four hours to get him to, at the end of it, the four hours, move me into the fifth hour. He goes, fuck. He says, man, I can't believe I didn't get that. Because what happens is, when you are in love with your martial art, mm. you'll look at me and go, why, I've never seen him in the UFC. What's this old guy talking about? When you're in love with something, and this is the biggest danger, I'll caution everybody listening to this too. Situational awareness is a conscious cognitive skill. When you mm. train something so much and you believe in it, you develop a romantic relationship with those moves. If you've got a favorite mm. food, when you're starving, you go right to that. You won't see the other food. You know you're thirsty, you're going for water. You know you're hungry, you're, you're going right for that. When we fall in love with jujitsu, krav, thai, adrenaline, spear, whatever it is, you fall in love with it, all you see are opportunities for spear, for your go-to move. for uh, uh, and, I, and, I, and I break it down and I say this as the old cantankerous you know, guy, I go, if someone walks up to you in the street and you're a jujitsu fanatic and he goes, mm -hmm. I'm going to fuck you up. Give me your money. It's a strong arm arm or a robbery, right? He's got no weapon. Either he's there like that. He's grabbed you. Give me your fucking wallet. The jujitsu guy isn't going to think about a liver shot or a round kick to the head. He's going to think mm -hmm. about taking the guy down. The Taekwondo guy, same scenario happens to the Taekwondo guy. The Taekwondo guy is not going to go, well, I'm going to fucking, you know, uh, double leg the guy, mount him and smack him on the head. He'll turn over and I'll strangle him. The Taekwondo mm -hmm. guy is going to be thinking about, I got to create space and kick him. We mm -hmm. default unconsciously to the range that supports the toolbox we developed. Now, this is very high level. Some people uh, you may not grasp this yet. It took Rondon Vito four hours to understand this. So it, you know, it may take me longer than just this live talk. Your love of your martial art creates a romantic relationship to using your martial art. But here's the most important thing. There's a, a, a maxim, there's a slogan that I, uh, that I, I started saying a, a couple of decades ago. Be careful what you practice. You might get really good at the wrong thing. Mm, I've heard you say that before, yeah. Yeah, be careful what you practice. You might get really good at the wrong thing. 
And what a lot of people did is they got very defensive and said, I was knocking martial artists. Let's, for the record, on your show, let me say this. All of my competence, confidence, material success, spiritual success, world travel is because I'm a martial artist, because of my love of martial arts. But what mm -hmm. I figured out a long time ago is that, and I, I love weapons too, I collect weapons. I've got a fucking spear, an actual spear that was given to me as a gift. If I needed to defend my family right now, I wouldn't grab a spear. I would grab my Glock, my Benelli, mm. a Tomahawk, right? Like the weapons that I have, modern weapons. So as I matured and evolved and as people started saying, I need to solve this violent problem, I realized that I didn't, I couldn't give them uh, ancient tools. I need to give them monster, uh, 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 modern tools, modern mm. concepts. How do people attack us now? You know, we, we talk about it in our scenario training. It's got to be realistic, relevant, and rigorous. If I said, hey, get a horse, I'm getting a horse, get a long fucking stick, and you and I are going to run at each other on horseback with a fucking long stick and joust, well, we could both die from that, right? That stick could go in our neck or in our eye or through our stomach. So that's realistic training, but mm. it's not relevant because nobody's riding horses with fucking jousting poles anymore. <laughs> so what, what a lot of people don't do is they're not looking at what is the contemporary problem I need to face and does my system uh, uh, support that? So circling back to, 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 to finish this, be careful what you practice. You might get really good at the wrong thing. When yeah. we train anything, we create neural patterns to do the moves that we like to do. And we could say, Oh, no, I do all of this. I do it. But everyone has a favorite move, a favorite go to move. And what I'm asking people to do, and that's when we do our scenarios, is we try to create scenarios that challenge people to do something besides their favorite move. So that they're actually it's what I call I jokingly call the Socratic pause. Can you come up with the right answer for this problem right here? Not the answer your teacher wants you to say. Right or not the theoretical uh, answer, and and it's really interesting. Um, in, in case I got a little too nerdy there, I'll, I'll share this quick story. I was running a scenario uh, program in the '80s, and I said to the group, "The fight's going to happen down here, and there will be a fight. As soon as you can break contact, you're going to run, and you're going to hit." The, we had a juice bar at our first school in Montreal, and it was about 30 or 40 feet away from where. The scenario is going to take place. And I said, if you can break contact as early as you can, get to that juice bar, that's safe haven. That's a cop on the street. That's a, a hospital. That's a place you can run to. And uh, this guy, Larry, puts up his hand. He says, uh, hey, Coach Blower, uh, with all due respect, uh, you know, we, we all know how to run. We came here to learn how to fight. And I said, Larry, the fact that you won't even entertain running in the scenario means your ego or pride is going to dictate your next strategy. Your brain mm. needs to create the neural pattern for the option to do that. So we would actually do scenarios like one of our scenarios back in the eighties was with, with the, with the helmet on. So you didn't get a finger in the eye or a, a busted nose is a verbal assault where the guy's just smacking the shit out of you, bitch slapping you, threatening you, and you couldn't do anything that drove mm. people crazy. Like they'd be there, fuck, oh, like, oh, fuck. they'd get hit. They'd want, I go, you can't fight back. Yeah. And, I, and I go, do you know why you're practicing this? There are times in confrontations where that self-restraint is what's going to keep you alive because you've been overwhelmed or swarmed and you know they're trying to scare you or send a message, but you know if you fight, this is going to escalate things. And some mm. of you listening to this might go, I would never, I would I go, yeah, there are scenarios where you're not doing shit. You just haven't entertained them. And here's the danger. If you haven't entertained that, like I've thought about what's a scenario where I would let myself get killed instead of fight. Yeah, if right? it's and to I, save your loved ones. Yeah. yeah, right. So if you knew if you fought right now, your wife and kids were for sure going to die. But if you didn't do anything, they were for sure going to live. And some of you might go, well, it's too bad for them. <laughs> like, I don't know what you're thinking. But what, what, I'm, what I'm talking about is this, is 
are you like peeling an onion, getting to the core of fear and psychology? And that's the thing. Listen, we've got hundreds of affiliates around the world. Every single one of them is a high level martial artist who runs their Krav, their, their Sambi program, their uh, uh, KC. We have, like we have everyone from every, from every system is training with us. I'll tell you a sad thing is a number of them have been booted out of their organizations for training with me. I, I find that reprehensible. It's like some instructor going, you can't train with Blauer. We don't have to talk about that, but that has happened numerous times. If somebody's training with me, I don't give a shit. If they want to affiliate with you or train with you, if they're getting something that is mm -hmm. feeding their passion in you, that's fine. My whole thing state. is this. Yeah. My, my whole thing is this. You ever hear the term time collapsing? Time collapsing. Time is a yeah. It's a, it's a business term that says basically, how can I, how can I save you a decade by you spending a day or two with me? Yeah. yeah. I, I, I had a guy on, on, a, on one of our webinar calls for our instructor uh, uh, trainer course. And I was explaining neurobiology, kinesiology, psychology, non-gender specific. This is uniform across the human species. This is the book, the book uh, the, uh, on neuroanatomy where this doctrine comes from. Here's an example of it. Here's a startle flinch on an ultrasound of an unborn baby flinching outside 90 finger splay doing a perfect half sphere. The baby's not even born yet. This is hardwired DNA. We're teaching you to weaponize it. And we're teaching you all this stuff. And this guy says, he says, so basically anyone could have figured this out because it's all science, right? I, and I said in my head, yes, motherfucker, but I figured it out. But I didn't say that out loud. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't say it out loud, Julian. I said to him, I said, yeah, I suppose anyone could have figured it out. But, and you could probably figure it out too. And this was like... Uh, uh, about two years ago on a webinar online when I went, everything became online. Um, I said, can I ask how old you are, sir? He goes, yeah, I'm turning 50. I said, well, happy birthday. I said, you know, it took me 40 years to create the current uh, uh, um, expression of the system. Mm. So you don't have to get certified with me because I don't make anyone bow to me. You were not wearing belts. It's like, it's almost like if I, if, if, uh, you know, you wanted to grow your business to the next level and someone says, hey, you should go to this public speaking course. It'll really help you when you're doing seminars. And you go, fuck you. I know how to talk. And then someone says, if you take this marketing course and you understand how to tell stories better, you'll convert more people into your great program. Fuck you. Like, it's, so I, I, I look at what we're doing as continuing education for professionals. We're teaching you what I figured out over 30 years working with the top people in the world on scenario design, on managing fear, on why wouldn't you want to bring that to your school and your students? Mm. Why, why are, and I said to this guy, you're 50. It took me 40 years to get it to here. Guess what? Hop off the call. And start working now. And when you're fucking 90, you'll have an amazing self-defense system. Right? You want to wait till you're 90? And I said, or you can just come and train with the other hundreds of people who've come to our system. And I'll just give it to you. I'm going to teach you why and how, where it came from. We call that substance versus subject. Everyone's a subject matter expert. But not a lot of people know the origin. I call that the substance matters expert. I want every coach or trainer who affiliates with us to have that substance, you know? So it's, it's interesting because, because, you know, every industry, you have people that, you know, think they can do it better than somebody else. And they, you know, could be a hairdresser. They leave and they steal a bunch of clients and they open up their salon, but they're still just fucking cutting hair. Um, the, the martial arts world is really, really interesting. And you know, this and have experienced this. Everyone thinks they could beat everyone else up. Everyone looks and it's a macho thing. We look at it, you know, I thought it'd be bigger. And nobody's thinking this. And I've said this a long time ago. And I've, I've since kind of let it go because I realized like it wasn't worth my energy. I would end every podcast or every talk with don't hate me, hate the bad guy. Don't hate me, hate the bad guy. 
I'm not the bad guy. I'm trying to make the world safer. That was my mission when I was 20. Somebody asked me, a venture capital asked me, hey, what do you want to do? You got the X factor, kid. You're fucking doing things differently. I said, I want to make the world safer. He said, how are you going to do that? I said, I think there should be as many self-defense systems as there are people practicing how to defend themselves. I'll say that again, because that might slip over some people's heads. I'm not being facetious. There should be as many self-defense systems as there are people learning self-defense. If you're teaching someone how to move like you, then they're trying to emulate you, but they're not you. So I teach people, this is how you will move because what I'm showing you is based on your neurobiology, your kinesiology, your biomechanics. I had a student that was born with no arms and no legs. Hmm. Like, how the fuck are you teaching him? But I did, and he was fucking dangerous as shit. But I, the whole psychology and approach to what he was going to do, the way he would move, literally born with no arms and no legs, came to uh, one of our, our, our seminars. Hmm. Google Kyle Maynard. Kyle Maynard. The guy climbed Kilimanjaro with no arms and no legs. The guy oh, he, he could get... Kyle, K-Y-L-E, uh, yep. K-Y-L-E Maynard, M-A-Y-N-A-R. And go, go, go do a, a highlight reel of him doing some MMA. No arms, no legs. Okay. Fucking destroying people. Fucking scary. But he, I remember he bought a high gear suit for one of, his, one of his team so that they could be a bad guy. And he got his credit card out of his wallet faster than you and I can with a stump. Mm. I was just sitting there going, fuck me. But I mean, my, my point being, if your system isn't based on the organic resources that your client presents and carries with them, then, and this is so heavy and so spiritual, it's like, how do I make you safer? Well, I look at what you bring to the fight and that will change every two, five or 10 years. Do you have any kids, Julian? Yeah, I got one. I got a little girl. Well, not so little now. She's uh, she's going to be 13 years old. Wow. Amazing. So if you think back 15 years ago, the, the things that set you off when you were driving in Europe or, or coming out of a pub still set you off 13 years ago. But now, right? So 15 years ago, you might have gone, hey, what did you say, man? Whack, you know, nail the guy. And, 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 and drop them or whatever. But then 13 years ago, something magical happened in your life and your girlfriend or wife gave birth to a girl. And now you're out and something happens and you're like, let's move, let's move, get in the car quickly. Like now it's mm -hmm. all about de-escalation and avoidance, but it didn't yeah. change. Yeah. So this is what people, that's why I say, don't let ego or pride di dictate your next strategy. We, 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 I, I, this is one of my my frustrations with the self defense and martial art world, is mm. is is like that level of of conscientiousness and and uh, the relationship between self awareness and situational awareness is oftentimes misunderstood. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's kind of understanding who we are and what we're capable of and what what we would do when when it's not about us anymore. Uh, right. It's 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 funny because. Uh, uh, Every time when I ask a question and you, you give me that, that, that long answer, which is great. And at the end of the long answer, you're already talking about what well, I'm going to ask you in the next question. It's awesome. Um, how deeply do you go into de-escalation tactics? Do you have a strategy for that? Because a, a, a lot of systems out there are not really focusing. They're just saying, hey, man, just stay away from me. And, and that is it. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah. Do, do you do yeah. scenarios where you're actually teaching people proper de-escalation tactics? hundred percent. So, so anybody who trains with us gets introduced to a map called the timeline of violence. And in the timeline of violence, there's a, like, there's a series of sections of it that, that every student becomes skilled at understanding, but also most importantly, integrating the, in the timeline of violence, we break things down into the three D's detect, diffuse, defend, detect and avoid defuse and deescalate and defend. Most mm -hmm. systems focus on D3. Most systems focus on the physical because that's the fun. That's the exciting stuff. But if you're practicing the physical all the time, 
or exclusively, you're not developing any de-escalation strategies or skills, uh, and you're certainly not developing any situational awareness stuff. It's one thing to just say, hey, you know, avoid dangerous places. Don't don't go to fucking, you know, uh, shithole areas. And then and then, like you said, Julian, there's a lot of systems that just say things like, hey, get back, get back. Right. But that's not de-escalation. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a real science to de-escalation. And um, I can't get into all of it here because it would, it would be turned into a seminar. But it's this idea of recognizing this. And this is a very provocative concept. Your opponent controls the fight. Nobody likes to hear that. I mostly train law enforcement and military. And I'll start this lecture by saying, who controls the fight? They go, we do. I go, unfortunately, you don't. The location that you went to is controlled by the bad guy. The address that you went to was because someone said, this is where the problem is. If you're getting in your car and you're going, hey, I'll call you back. I got to go. And then you turn around and there's somebody, one or two guys beside your car, even though that's where you park, they control the location. They waited for you to be distracted and they moved on. They decided that was the kill zone. Who controls the next, the next thing asks, who controls the location, the bad guy? Who controls the level of violence when the fight starts? Well, mm -hmm. if I walked up to you, Julian, in the street and I'm a drunk and I go, hey, man, uh, I got no money. I need a drink. And you're like, hey, back off, man. And you're thinking, okay, fence here, I'll get ready to fucking blast this guy. But the guy's a drunk. And let's say he's a drunk that looks like, you know, uh, your, your crazy uncle that you haven't seen in 30 years. And it's not him, but you you feel a little empathy for the guy. Okay, man, I'll fucking buy him a drink, or should I not? I don't want him to drink. Hey, mate, I, I don't, don't get so close to me. The guy goes, come on. But he's not being violent. But mm. he just violated the fence. Are you dropping him? Are you headbutting him? Are you eye gouging him? Or are you you're pushing no. him off? You're just you're hopefully you're a good Samaritan. You're you know yeah. you're gently moving the guy away, making sure you're not in any danger. My point yeah. being here is the the level of force that you chose had nothing to do with the guy was close to me and he touched me. Yeah, it was yeah. he was a drunk who was stumbling, and my intuition said this isn't a setup. I have yeah. one of my students, one of my students had a homeless guy ask him for money. And he said, he, the guy, he put his hands up, my student put his hands up and said, sorry, I can't help you. And the guy had his hands in his jacket, hand comes out with a screwdriver, goes to shank him, boom, spear across the body, knocks the guy back. Remember, the spear deploys like a biological airbag. It doesn't mm. think. And it saved his life. This guy had done one weekend seminar with me in the 80s. He, he messaged me on LinkedIn like 15 years later, saying, you're not going to believe what happened to me. And I go, yeah, I do believe it. It's an organic response. My point being there is that here's another situation where, hey, sorry, man, can't help you. Got no money. Wasn't thinking anything's going to happen. All of a sudden, the attack happened. So I just want to point out the bad guy controls the fight. You think you're de-escalating. Next thing you know, there's a knife or a gun out. So the next thing that happens is influenced by the thing the bad guy did. If I walk up to you and I go, I want to fight you, and I take a sparring stance, you might go, look, man, like, you remember the Bruce Lee, the famous Bruce Lee story? I don't push, I punch. Remember when he dropped the guy on stage, right? So for people who never heard that story, I don't know if it's an urban legend, but it's in a bunch of books. Bruce Lee's up on stage with a, with a few other martial art masters, and one of the masters stands up and he says, um, I have, we have a stance in our system that cannot, you can't be pushed from. It's impossible to push you. And he gets up into whatever the stance was and he invites the first guy and the guy tries to push him and he can't move him. And the second guy tries to push him. He can't move him. And then he looks to, to Bruce and legend is it. He said, you know, Hey, little dragon. He says something derog derogatory. It's your turn. And Bruce gets up in front of him and fucking pops him and drops the guy and says, when I fight, I don't push. I punch. You've heard that story, Julian, right? I think I have. Yeah. So, I mean, who knows if it's true or not, urban legend, but it's a classic example of, you know, the bad guy controls the fight, the location, the duration, uh, uh, sorry, the location, the level of violence and the duration. The duration part is uh, if I hit you and you get up, you need to hit me again. Or, sorry, I need to hit you again. Um, I, we were doing some, some work uh, for a, a gunfighting clinic and it would tell people like, like, if bullets worked all the time, you'd only need one bullet. 
why did, why do you have a high capacity magazine? Well, because mm. bullets don't always work. So why did you shoot the guy 14 times? Well, because 13 bullets didn't work. Why did you hit the guy six times? Well, he was still a threat for five. Oh, shit. Holy fuck. He's still coming. Finally, whatever the move was, dropped him or stunned him. And I was able to, you know, to, to, to solve the problem. But people don't think that way. So I know this is crazy because it's a, you asked me about de-escalation. The de-escalation system that I teach must be congruent with mm. the scenario you're in. Would you yeah. ever let somebody, would you ever let somebody grab you by the lapels and slam you against the wall? You personally? No. Okay. I mean, it, anything could happen, but you know, I'd, I'd probably see that coming from, from, you know, from before it happened. I would probably spot pre-threat indicators, but maybe not. Maybe not. You never know what could happen. You're, I mean. you're, 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 you're in a crowded pub, walking like sardines, getting out. All of a sudden, someone grabs your shoulder, turns you and grabs you. Yeah, and what that could be, happen. What be, and what would be your go-to move right after they grabbed you? <laughs> Just probably go be, be impactive. I'd probably be impacted from from the from the start yeah right but i mean they're here like this and you're like whoa right you you know box the ears some grabs the eyes palm strike grab the head drop an elbow knee the nuts they're open everywhere because they've got both their blocking and striking tools tied mm -hmm. up on your jacket or your shirt so i've asked that question for 30 years the first time i asked it do you know the form i don't even know if they're around they were one of the biggest in the uh, mma.tv run by kirik Jenis. It was one of the biggest forms. I, don't, I, I know they're still around, but there's so many forms now. But they kind of like, they were the go-to place back in the eight, late 80s, early 90s. And I had a form on there. And I asked that question. And everyone answered, lapel grab, gouge the eyes, box the ears, drop an elbow, headbutt, fucking knee the nuts, uh, you know, this move, that move, all these moves. And then here's what I said, Julian. This was the scenario. You're in a loud, crowded club. And are you married or is it your girlfriend that you had the baby with? No, no, it's not. It's, 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 it's complicated. But no, I'm, I'm, I'm actually single at the moment. I'm, I'm looking okay. for my ex-wife. Okay. Um, well, <laughs> sorry I brought that up. But uh, no this, this, this might be even more relatable. So you're in, you're in the bar and you just had a fight with your ex. And you go, you know what, I'm going outside for a cigarette or I'm going outside for a cigar or I'm going outside for some air or we need to take a break. And I described this scenario on MMA TV and I'm just sharing it with you right now, right? Mm. And as you get up to leave, you go, you're, I can't believe we're fighting again. You know, we need to take a break. You step out and as you turn your back to her, she grabs your shoulder, spins you, grabs you by the lapels, pulls you in and says, I love you, let's work this out and plants a kiss on your lips. And I go, and I said, all of you, I said, all of you guys just need your girlfriend or your wife in the balls. I go, it's okay. Like if you're dating a guy, it's like, you know, I, like I made a joke and everyone got mad at me, right? Because what I said was, I said, what would you do if somebody grabbed you by the lapels and everyone had all these martial art answers? Mm. And I said, you need to always start with what's the scenario? Because if I had said to you, a loved one grabs you by the lapels and says, please, please, don't leave me. I love you. You're not going. Like you're, you're, not, you're, not, you're not doing it. You're, the scenario changes. It's like you have to make your OODA loop work you know, at that point before you do anything. The, the yeah, to me, OODA loop is more of a, um, is more of a, a D1 situational awareness where things are at a distance. Um, okay. But that's that's a whole other conversation on on OODA loop. So interestingly, yeah. as a sidebar, uh, years ago I was teaching at the uh, the Illinois Tactical Officers Association, and uh, uh, Boyd, who wrote, who developed the OODA loop, was one of the guest speakers. So I actually, you know, he's a legend in the military. I actually got to hang out with him and meet him and and get a picture with him, which was kind of cool because he's uh, again a legend. But the um, more of the idea here is this, is we tend to, and this comes back to muscle memory, neural patterns, uh, situational awareness, de-escalation. If a system says, hey, 
I'm going to hit this stance here. We're going to call it this. If it's, if he touches your finger, you drop him with a right. That's not a scenario analysis. And that, that doesn't change or inform what we're going to say. Because, and I've given like, like scenarios for, um, I ask cops the same question. Would you let anyone grab you by the lapels and slam you against the wall? And everyone's absolutely not. I go, well, what are you doing if somebody does that? They're getting sprayed. They're getting baton. They're getting hit. Mm-hmm. I said, okay, um, you just brought in a girl, a teenage girl, who has been attacked, beaten, raped. The parents come in. You're the first responder on the scene. They're talking to the doctor. The doctor says, points, points to you, saying, like, that's the cop that brought her in. The mom comes in crying. She's going in, and you're doing, hey, uh, we got a lead on, on someone's song. We got to, uh, you know, we're, we're tracking this down. And the father goes and steps in. He grabs you. He goes, who the fuck did this to my daughter? I said, are you still hitting the guy? You're still hitting the guy? And they're like, oh, well, in that case. Not in that case. Our, our, our systems, our brain, our self-defense training needs to incorporate this fucking shit. And people don't. So yeah. that's why I say, like, like we have a whole program called Choice Speech. How do you create rapport? How do you create conscience and accountability? Accountability. How do you buy time if you need to shift psychological gears? So if you know danger is imminent and it's going to happen, what are things you can do that are going to impact the refractory delay? That's a big fancy word for the gap time in stimulus response. Because the the I can by things I can say to you, Julie, and I can change your reaction time. Mm. I've seen you move You're very very fast. You got very fast uh, fast twitch muscle fibers. But I can make you move slower by think, mm-hmm. by saying things to you, by getting you to listen to me or ask questions. And I've done it for decades. It's not magic. It's, just, yeah. it, it's not magic. It's just understanding neuroscience. Yeah. What was your question? Is it, is it like pattern interruption? Yeah. I mean, which is a term that we brought to the industry as well in the 80s, yeah. right? Is that, that, that pattern interrupt distraction. Yeah. But it can't be, it can't be random. It needs to be congruous with the scenario. Yeah. So, if, you know, if, if, if you and I are about to fight and I go, wow, look, there's a floating elephant over there. You might look, but you, but as your brain goes, there's no such thing as a floating elephant. You know, that I'm <laughs> like it, 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 it changes. But if, if, uh, you know, you and I are about to square off and I, and I go, I go, Hey man, like there's, Literally, there's fucking three undercover cops in this bar right now. I know who they are. If we fight right now, we're, we're both going to jail. And you, you, we still may fight, but you're now going, is what the fuck's he talking? Because that could be true. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. You know, I'm being followed. You're following me. And, and I go, oh, fuck, like, my man, I'm like 200 yards from my car. And I've had people use these strategies, right? You're following me and I turn around. So let's say you were you were you were gonna mug me and I turn around and stop, you're gonna stop, right? Like you're following me. Let's say you're like 20 feet away and closing, and all of a sudden I turn around and I stop and I look at you, you're gonna stop. That's just human behavior. Oh fuck, he saw me, he got me. Now you might mm-hmm. go, hey, hey, I got a question. Like you might try to close, but what if I pattern interrupt? If I say to you, hey man, or uh uh I don't know how to do this. It's my first time, but I'm an informant and I'm supposed to meet some undercover cop. Are, are you the, are, are you the guy? Well, you're going to be looking at me going now, if you're a mugger, if you're a mugger, what's in your fucking head right now? First of all, this yeah. guy's a bad guy. He's an informant. I was mm. about to mug another bad guy. I have rapport. Pretty clever right now. But the guy's mm. also going, cause what do bad guys not want? Bad guys want to keep raping and pillaging, stealing and doing their shit. Bad guys don't want to get hurt. They don't want to get hurt. They don't want for things to take too long. So now the bad guy has rapport with you because you just said, I'm a bad guy too. I'm a fucking rat. I'm an informant. Yeah. And then you go, you go, hey, like, are you the undercover cop I'm supposed to meet? And the guy's like, uh, oh man, sorry, I got I got the wrong guy. And then you just kind of like, you know, put your back up against the wall, like as if you were supposed to meet there. That guy's not mm-hmm. fucking mugging you right now because he thinks mm-hmm. there's gonna be a cop showing up. Mm, mm. Right. So what you've done is totally 
like deflated and diffused the fight using disinformation, yeah. disinformation, not misinformation. So a big part of our, our training is what is disinformation versus misinformation? And I look at the D2, the de-escalation part, Julian, as more important than the physical. If, yeah. if you are, hang on a sec. We got, uh, I'm in my, in my, I'm in our tactical garage gym. This is where I teach yeah. four times a week. Uh, and we got the, my garage doors open and we had a garbage truck coming by. Um, if, if you're in, in a, a situation where you can morally, ethically, legally diffuse it, you're supposed to do that. Yeah, absolutely. You know? And especially, I mean, I shouldn't say this, especially uh, in Europe, because it should be everywhere. But there's so much CCTV in Europe that, fuck. you know, if you just haphazardly just fuck somebody up because you go, he deserved it. Well, guess what? You know, you may end up being somebody's wife in jail. Mm. So, yeah, we do a lot in de-escalation and, and, and we do a lot of scenarios where, you know, you're working on the D1 part, you're working on the D2 part, you're working on D3 part. I want all of my clients and certainly every one of my instructors needs to be able to teach this. Whether they all, like I have, you know, just to do a, a shameless plug for our trainer course, regardless of what you're doing, adding a more efficient explanation and, and uh, drill sequencing of how do you weaponize the airbag? How do you manage fear? Uh, how do you do scenarios at another level to your program? Just when it just makes you a better instructor. Again, like I said earlier, it's professional education. It makes your students safer, which helps with attrition, which helps with their fear. Uh, and it, it elevates your, your, your school's offerings because it differentiates you from so many other people that don't delve into this area or, or provide that. But mm. the, I, 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 think, I think that's super important. You know, there's, you know, there's cooking schools, there's auto mechanic schools, there's shooting schools. It's going to get really noisy in one second. Hold on. Um, can you still hear me okay? I can hear you okay. Just, just go on to yeah. the school. Yeah, I can't, I can't hear shit now because the truck's there. But um, All right. I'll wait for him. It'll, it'll be uh, two seconds. <laughs> And one more. I, I, I'm so far away from my computer, I can't see any of the questions or comments. So, uh, let me have a I don't look. Know if there's any good ones there. Um, and we're all clear and he's off. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, if I said, if I said to you, some guy just grabbed your jacket and he's about to fucking haul off and hit you, what would you do? Like there's like a hundred things come to mind, right? You would get inside, you'd crash inside, you'd smash him. If he's still going, fuck you, fuck you. If I put my head in front of you, my arm in front of you, you'd go, okay, grab the head here, smack an elbow here, headbutt him here, gouge the guy, pull his hair, punch him in the fucking neck, fucking knee him, do this. Like anybody who trains can do an endless string of combinations on a Bob dummy or on a, mm -hmm. someone in high gear. But if I said to you, uh, you just turned around in an ATM and there's a guy there with his hand in his pocket and he's at a, a distance. So he goes, don't fucking try anything. I'll shoot you. Give me your fucking wallet. And I said, mm -hmm. what would you say to him? Most people go, they, they honestly, most people go, including instructors, they go, well, you know, I could say a bunch of things. Like if I thought, I go, no, 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 what would you say to him? And they answer by going, well, you know, in this scenario, I would try to, in other words, if I said to you, I'm moving towards you, Julian, and your hand is like that, and we're in a bar and it, having an argument that I get up and I come towards the camera, you would just go whack, you know, you'd fucking drill me with your right hand if you would practice like closest weapon, closest target shit, right? It's right there. Mm -hmm. Why would you do a back kick when, when you got a, a fucking straight punch or a jab loaded? Yeah. I doesn't see it. But if I say it to anybody, and I've done this again, it's, it's such a great example. Um, you know, I had 10 people in 
were, uh, we literally had 10 people this weekend. I do these things every couple of months. It's limited to 10 people. We had uh, someone from Germany, Austria, UK, Canada, and the rest of the group was from the USA in. And I asked the group, you know, what would you do? Guys got you by the throat here. Everyone had an answer. Some guy's pulling your arm. Everyone had an answer. Some guy's throwing a punch. Everyone had an answer. And then when I said, what would you do if uh, you're sitting in your car, you're looking at your phone and someone opens your car door? Mm. What, what, would you, what would you say right away? They, and, they, and they're all like, you know, I'd, I'd probably say something like, I mean, what do you probably say something like means you haven't thought about it enough yeah, yeah. to know what you would say. Mm. And so... This is like the end of a 30 minute answer about how important it is for de-escalation is I believe for moral, ethical, legal reasons, but also for tactical reasons that your D2 arsenal is more important than your D3 arsenal. Why? Because I could, I can change your reaction time by if I, if I were talking, we're having an argument and I say to you, listen, man, I don't want to fight you. And you're like, well, I think we're going to fight. And I go, well, I got three reasons why we shouldn't fight. Number one, I'm a hemophiliac. You know what that is? That means if you hit me, I got glass jaw syndrome. You hit me, you're going to jail for manslaughter. I'm a hemophiliac. Mm -hmm. If I get hit really hard in the head and I'm like, wow, and all of a sudden I'm on you because you're like listening to this hemophiliac story that you can't mm -hmm. tell. So you can use language to get a predator to go, as soon as this guy finishes his story, I'm going to fucking punch him because he's really annoying me. But he's listening to the story. Right? Yeah. Um, you understand what I'm saying? So I, I, all of my students, I tell them, work your D2 arsenal. One for the bank, one for the car, one for the ATM, one for you're on a trail, one for a mugging, one for... You look at... There's People go, oh, there's so many ways to get attacked in the world. No, there's not. There's a limited ways to get attacked and mm. there's limited places. What's the difference between like this punch in an octagon mm. and that punch in a bar or that punch in a cave in Afghanistan? There's zero difference. The mm. difference is the scenario and the fear, the equipment you might have. Mm -hmm. So, so you, we need to look stuff at stuff from the attack specific. What is, what is, what is the best way to optimize the human weapon system? But then we look at the, at the scenario. When I asked you an hour ago about what's your move for a headlock or what you would do grappling with a friend, right? So my move, I set up the scenario, you know, one of my moves in a headlock is as soon as I, I, I secure the hand right away, because that's, I, don't want to, I don't want the guy to get me in a headlock and boom and fire a quick shot, you know, flash mm -hmm. knockout, stun me and then get stomp on my head. I, I secure the hand right away. I stabilize because there's only three things he can do if we're in a street fight at that moment with both his hands tied up. He can punch me in the face. He could hip throw me or he could run my head into a fucking car or wall. Mm -hmm. So if I negate all of those, I put him in flux. That's when I go to work and there is, you know, uh, gouge the eyes, depending on how tall he is, go to the groin. And I start doing closer to weapon, close to target. But so that's the default for personal safety. But then what I do, well, you know, my, my son, who's now 32 and bigger and stronger than me, you know, if he, like, hasn't seen me in a couple of months because he lives out of town, he runs up to me and grabs me and puts me in a headlock, I'm not fucking gouging his eye and smacking him in the nuts. The scenario changed. So so I, I don't I don't want people to be, you know, I'm, I'm exaggerating to make a point. We need, we need to all do a better job of being conscientious and good humans being it's almost like the jordan the famous jordan peterson quote right yeah. a harmless yeah. man is a useless yeah. man right be yeah. dangerous but have it under control yeah i love jordan peterson great like he's making so much great points how about how about i mean i i got a shitload of all the questions man you know if you if you get the time but how about we Yo, let's, let's, let's keep going a bit more how, how about we speak about fear i know fear is your main subject so I, I watched your seminar uh, today, the, the seminar that Jenny sent me, uh, the No Fear seminar. And uh, I've, I've dabbled into a bit of what you do with, with, uh, with fear management uh, 
for a couple of years now. But I, that gave me a really good insight into the behavioral cycle, the the the, the fear loop, and I thought that was really interesting. Do, do you want to speak about this? Yeah, how you, sure. How do, you, how do you override this feeling to to find um, the most resourceful uh, the most resourceful answer to 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 answer the the, the situation? Yeah. So, uh, uh, good question. Probably the most significant uh, or potent part of our fear management course is and just for anybody. I don't know if anyone's listening to this or, or people are only watching this, and I don't have my No Fear shirt on, but No Fear is spelled K N O W, K N O W, not N O Fear. So the 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 initial paradigm shift is this idea that um, there's no such a thing as no fear. And and guys that battle, bounce, you know, smash their chest and go, fuck fear, no fear, and they're doing that, have fear. Mm -hmm. you, don't need, you don't need to posture like that. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, people who say, I'm not afraid of anyone. Um, the, like, if you're, if you're yelling it, you're afraid of something. You just don't have the self-awareness to, to express it in in a co coherent way and i'm not knocking things it's just like our, all of our journeys is self-awareness things that i understand um you know this this morning i virtually watched uh it wasn't the best thing to watch before having to come on your show but my father-in-law passed away two days ago and and his oh, funeral was this morning and so like that's what i was doing this morning up at, at 6 30 because at a time zone a different time zone and I did that. And at 63, like I'm going, oh, shit, my mom passed away last year. Now her husband passed away. And I'm reliving all of that. And, you know, sitting there watching that tears coming to my eyes. And I'm thinking about mortality and longevity and legacy. Mm -hmm. and, and, and what do you do? And um, that's all fucking fear, my friend. Right. And mm -hmm. and so what was important to me when I was 10 years old changed when I was 10, 20 changed when I was 30 changed when I was 40 changed when I was 50 changed when I was 60 and almost everything we do runs through an unconscious fear loop. And so when I developed the no fear program and I explained this, I, 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 I separate to our hand to hand stuff. I do a lot of things. Uh, uh, you know, we have a, a business coaching program. We've got a, uh, another, I hate the term transformation program, but it is it's a 90 day program, but it's, it's really built around understanding fear and managing fear and being a better protector for yourself or a courageous bystander. If some shit happens in the street and it's a really interesting program, but it's all predicated on this idea that if you get to K N O W fear, you can manipulate the fear right now. If, if, you went no fear, no fear, and then something was presented to you where you suddenly got a fear spike. Well, that fear spike will create, and you have no choice, a negative movie in your mind. And that's called the fear loop. And so we use the acronym false expectations appearing real and visualizing something in the future. It hasn't happened, but it's immobilizing me in the present. It's either making me move slower or overthink. And like, so I know guys that have, who hunt terrorists, who are bad guys, like full-time SWAT team, been in multiple gunfights. And I said, are you afraid to get in a gunfight, to run towards the gunfire? And they go, absolutely not. I go, how do you know? Go, well, I've been in gunfights. I go, okay, are you, and that same group, and I tell this story often in our No Fear program, where I'm working with this full-time SWAT team in Texas, and I say to the group, and every one of them had been in a gunfight. Every one of them had been like in like fucking serious shit and proven that that their training and their mindset supported them. And and I love telling the story. So here's these 12 alpha males, guys that you would want on, on your fucking speed dial if the shit hit the fan. And I say to them, guys, we're going to take a break. Does anyone have a question? Anybody? No question? Okay. As soon as we break... People come up to me with questions and I go, I just said, is anyone a question? Yeah, but I didn't want my buddies to hear this. I don't want, like the number one fear in the world is still public speaking. 
So my mm. point for everyone, if you're still listening, you can be like, like a born killer, but you're afraid to say, I'm sorry. You're afraid to say, I love you. You're afraid to give a speech. You're afraid to ask somebody for a raise. You're afraid to get a divorce or get married. You're, we all have fear. So the no, the no fear program is about understanding the psychology of fear and its effect on our lives instead of the physiology and biology. And that's what really separates our program from every other fear management approach because most fear man management approaches really focus on, on sympathetic versus parasympathetic breathing, meditation, uh, yeah. how to change your state. I do all that stuff too. It's not part of the program. I just tell people, look, I meditate, I work on breathing. It's really important, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But it's the coach in our head that creates movement. The mind navigates the body. When you get a fear spike, it immediately puts you in the fear loop. If the fear spike is physical and close, it will trigger a flinch. If you look down at your watch to see the time right now, and there was a fucking big spider on your leg, mm. you wouldn't go like this. You wouldn't go, you'd go, shit, right? There'd be, because your nervous system just would react. It would bypass cognition. It's not supposed mm. to be there. So fear creates a psychological distraction that you need to clear. Almost like for anyone who shoots, if you get a stovepipe on a, on a firearm or a double mm. feed, you need, you need to clear that. But you don't clear in advance of the malfunction. You clear yeah. after the malfunction. Mm -hmm. right? And I make this joke. You shoot, don't you, Julian? You're a shooter. I have right? shot quite a lot with my father and a bit all over the world, yeah. I mean, I've okay. not, done, not done for so, a while, but... Yeah. So, but what I'm saying is, like, if you're at the range and you're going bang, 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 bang click, ah, fuck, click, boom, 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 right in your back and you put it. So the fear spike is like a gun malfunction. You don't want it. When it happens, that weapon doesn't operate properly. Can you still throw the gun? Can you hit somebody with it if you're really close? Yeah, but that's not yeah. what it's designed to do. The fear spike in your head, you don't want it. And if you don't clear it properly, what you're going to do next is going to be reactive based on the emotional, psychological state of the fear spike. And this is very subtle. So we've created ways to help you clear fear. And one of the things, going back to your question, is um, if you change your relationship with fear, you can change your mind or its effect on your mind. And the mm. biggest, probably most powerful thing I could share because I want everyone, of course, to do the seminar, not, not, to, not to get the whole thing for free here, but, the, but to do the seminar, is, um, is to realize that there are things you must do in life scared. Mm. And that's a huge thing for an alpha male, because we don't ever want to be afraid. And that's now full circle to your opening question to me. Tell us about yourself. The first thing I said is I have a special relationship with fear, because I grew up afraid of everything, but still mm. very skilled. I was one of the best skiers in Canada. Like I was competing at what's called the zone level for Quebec, but I was terrified every race, but nobody knew. I didn't tell my coach. I didn't tell my parents, but I didn't want to let down the team. I didn't like, and I, cause no one ever told me butterflies, adrenaline, sweaty were mm. physiological changes as a result of, the anticipation of adventure or danger. Had somebody told that to me properly, coached me in that, we might not be talking because maybe I've been a famous skier, right? Yeah. Um, but, it, but it was interesting, and I realized this in the 80s doing our, our scenario training, our force on force stuff, is that the, only the people that manage their fear manage to fight. Mm. Only the people who manage their fear manage to fight. And so there I realized, like, fear management is more important than managing how I physically move because there's lots of people that got in the ring to fight Mike Tyson and forgot how to fight until Buster Douglas. There's lots of people who, who go, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And then they don't even show up at the fight or everything they were doing in the changing room, all of the fucking combos. Now they're running around the ring with their eyes wide open and they're still badass. Have you ever seen like a UFC level fighter, just fucking choke in the ring like he's just like horrible yeah but that guy in a street fight would be a whirlwind that guy fighting 
99% of the population would, would blitz through, but he let fear get to his head. And this is, I go back full circle to everyone listening to this. If you don't understand the neural circuitry of fear and the mindset, if it manifests itself at the wrong time, that's going to affect how you perform. And that could be a mm. speech, that could be in bed, that could be, you know, in business, in a meeting. And the worst and most dangerous place for that to happen is when you've got to defend yourself for real. Yeah. Yeah. No, true, true. I mean, like, yeah, fear is, is is one big thing, and I can relate to you, Tony. I've I've when I grew up as well, I was I was afraid of everything. Even though, like, yeah, I started the martial arts at four years old, so I've always known how to fight. But I was scared of the consequences, scared of getting hurt, scared of hurting the other person, scared of pretty much everything, man. It kind of took me uh, took me a while to. Unfortunately, I went from one extreme to the other extreme at some point in my life where I went from being scared of everything to beating everyone up until I had to kind of realize, oh, shit, I'm turning into what I what I hated the most, which is bullies. Right. So I, I got to stop. I got to check myself now uh, because it's all about yeah. other people. But, well, that's, uh, that's, that's, but that's because you're evolving and growing. And like I said, you know, every 10 years and that's just a generic number. But every 10 years, we reassess and we go, ah, you know, and uh, mm. uh, but but like now, here's the thing. You become you mean everyone listening to this, me, you, you become mm. more dangerous when you recognize fear early and you mm. can turn like one of our, our mottos is how do you turn fear into fuel? If forget mm. electric cars for the metaphor, but if your body is the car and your mind is the nav system and the directions you're going to go, then mm. what drives the car? What makes it run? Right. Our engine is our anaerobic capacity, our, our stamina and our endurance. What makes it run is the fuel. And in a violent encounter, fuel needs to be fear. If you think about this, here's one of our, 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 it's, it's this should be everyone's next tattoo but it's a line from our no fear program. You can't be brave if you're not afraid. There's no such a thing as bravery without fear. The primary ingredient in courage is fear. If you see some firefighter run into a burning building and rescue a family and you go, man, that was the bravest thing I, I've ever seen. And he goes, oh, no, I like the heat and I'm actually hoping to die in a fire one day. It just didn't happen today. You'd be like, okay, that was the weirdest fucking answer I ever heard. But if the guy wasn't afraid of the fire, then it didn't take any courage from the run into the building, right? Mm -hmm. So um, there's there's a, a a magical, almost serendipity, using a big fancy word, to changing a relationship with fear. So the moment you get a fear spike, you start to use this the system that we created. Okay, I'm in the fear loop here. What am I thinking? What am I believing? What's distracting me? There's a, there's a, there's a like a mental checklist that your brain goes through, and then suddenly you're doing this. <sighs> okay, and you're moving towards the danger, or and the danger being whatever you need to do. But you know, a fear spike creates doubt. Doubt creates hesitation. If you can't fix it there, it becomes procrastination. Violence mm -hmm. loves speed. If you can't improve your mind speed, you're always going to be late in a violent encounter. It's mind speed that's most important. Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump over some of the questions because you've answered a lot of stuff already. And there are a few things that I really want to ask you. Um, well, I want hey, to listen, ask man, you if, if, if Julian, sorry for interrupting. Yeah. If you get good feedback from this and, and you want to do another episode, uh, you know, because sure, we didn't I get love, the questions. That. Yeah. I, I was thinking at at some point probably in the, after the the next question to maybe go on to the more uh, spiritual path because I'd love to hear what you got to say. I'm, I mean, I've had a massive spiritual awakening in 2012. I drunk ayahuasca five times. Do you know what I mean? I've I've, I've worked a lot with plant medicine and I mean, there's stuff I I can speak about it uh, after. I don't know. I don't know what what your experience was with spirituality, but. I just got one last question that I want to ask yeah, you that's uh, training related before we get on to that. It's about scenario training. 
I know you're one of the top guys to create scenarios. Uh, the 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 other the other person from who I've I've learned how to create scenarios who's pretty good as well is uh, Lee Morrison, who's uh, my uh, who who was my main uh, my main instructor. Uh, I've been an instructor for him for for a while, and then I decided to do my own thing. But um, when it comes to creating scenarios, have you got some sort of model, something that you use to go right? Okay, so. This is the this is the strategy. This is the tactic. This is the the theme. And there's going to be that many role players, and I'm going to brief everyone, and and that's what we're going to use. That's the venue we're going to use. So how, how do you how do you quantify all this? How well, do you create good simulation? Yeah. So there is a whole science to that. In fact, um, we have a program called called Evidence Based Scenario Trainer. And there's, uh, I, I don't know when, oh, this is live. So if there's anybody who wants to travel, there's a two-day force-on-force scenario training gig in San Diego in October. So just go to my website, you'll, you'll find it. But we do this all over the world, mostly with law enforcement and military groups. Mm. Um, but the formula has been refined over decades. And uh, the way we do scenarios is very different than how many people do scenarios. Many people do scenarios to showcase their system, to showcase uh, how to overwhelm and decimate the attacker. We do scenarios to, I'm going to throw the word in here, to create a spiritual awakening, right? Not literally, but so that you realize, like I've done stuff where I have six guys in gear attack me. Mm. And, And so part of the meditation on it is, to honestly go, hey Tony, did you think you were going to take you were going to beat them six guys wearing gear in a scenario that they could set up? And the answer was yes, I did think. I found out I was wrong. Right? That's that's humbling, right? Mm. Um, so this is intimate stuff. So it depends on the group. Again, it depends on what's the scenario for the scenario training. What is our objective? If I have a bunch of people who are like, like uh, if you came to me when you were at the height of, of, of uh, your aggression, all the scenarios I would have given you, you wouldn't, you would have been allowed to fight. Mm. So you would have been going, what the fuck, man? I go, hey, this next scenario, uh, uh, you've been kidnapped, you're tied to a chair, these guys are going to smack the shit out of you. Okay, this next scenario, if you fight... Uh, your 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 mom, your dad, and your daughter are going to be fucked up. So that you had to find this place in your body to find the courage to walk, to not fight. And I tell people, it takes a lot of courage to shut your mouth. There's been situations where I go, I want to say something here, but that person's fucking insane. The type of insanity... Those four or five people that I highlight in that seminar I do for martial arts schools, just because you can doesn't mean you should. They're all dead because they didn't know how to keep their mouth shut. Not because they weren't brave, not because they weren't good fighters, because they went, you know what? Fuck this. Hey, boom. Mm. Right. So um, it's a tricky thing. So our, but our scenario program, I'm giving you a spiritual answer to your question. We have a fucking formula. And, and we reverse engineer scenarios, so there's no there's no sparring. Uh, there's there's scenarios where you're forced to work on situational awareness and avoidance. There's scenario phases where you're forced to work on D two, the diffuse and de-escalate. There's scenarios where it's just all physical. There's scenarios where you can't win, so that we can talk about, uh, hey, can you you know you do a scenario with uh, three four people jump you. And they're not hurting. They're not injuring you. One of our maxims is, uh, you know, training should hurt, but should never injure. Mm. And training should hurt your feelings, but not mm. injure. You get what I'm saying? Like mm. that's, that's kind of deep. So you're sick. I've had, I've had people after a, an event sit there with fucking tears running down their eyes going, fuck. And I go, why, why are you crying? man? Well, because my other instructor said, well, dude, this is, this isn't even the real world, but we came as close to replicating real world. But aren't you glad you found out that that shit you were doing doesn't work 
and you found mm -hmm. out in a safe haven amongst friends because if yeah. it was three guys in an alley they're not going to put their arm around you and mentor you um so you know the the like the byline on our evidence-based scenario training is the art and science of scenario training right there's an art to it and there's a science to it and what most people and i've watched tier one operators do scenario training and said they said what do you think i've been brought in like it's just a a combatives management guy like they're not even interested in spear they're interested in all, like my brain and assessing their program and i go you guys are just practicing d3 there's no build up there's no scenario there's no threat discrimination there's no dialogue all of that shit would be there if you just set up a target where bang 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 people have to shoot and and every solution is solved by hitting somebody or or, or shooting somebody that's not the real world you'll have a hundred missions where there's no gunfight and then you might have the next 50 there's a gunfight but if you're not practicing both so the biggest problem in the martial art world is is people aren't practicing the three pillars of self-defense avoidance de-escalation and defense and mm. some scenarios julian you need to be preemptive and some scenarios you're protective so meaning if i'm if i'm going hey julian listen i know you're upset i didn't mean to say that and also whack you come at me I need to weather that ambush. There's going to be a startle flinch if you're non-telegraphic. I got to get that airbag deployed. I got to get my hands on you. But, you know, at that moment, and I love doing this, I go, hey, some guy shoves you, goes, I'm going to, I have always wanted to punch you so hard in the face, you piece of shit. And he comes at you with a haymaker and you do, you crash into him or you fucking do the spear. What are you doing right after that? And everyone has an answer. I mount him, I hit him in the face. Oh, I grab his head, I headbutt him. And I go, you're at your sister's wedding and this is your drunk uncle, Bob. You guys mm -hmm. hated each other your whole life. He's drunk now. And your sister said, because he knows you're a martial artist, get him out of here, get some coffee in him. He's fucking embarrassing me. And you walked up to him and you go, Uncle Bob, let's go. Get your fucking hands off me. Come on, Uncle Bob. Now you can beat him up. But mm -hmm. you're wearing a white suit at an outdoor wedding. And he says, you know what? I always wanted to punch you in the face, you smug piece of shit. And do you know how many people answer that and they've killed the guy? Mm. I do this. I do this. I don't know that. Fucking Chinese connection shit. Like, right? And I go, it's your drunk Uncle Bob. And they go, oh, you fuck boy. You should have said that. I go, no, motherfucker. You don't understand scenario training. Mm. So, so it's so big. Our, listen, if we were just teaching people how to break people's necks and smash people out, I'd have like a thousand affiliates. But we only have a couple hundred affiliates because our program's only for conscientious professionals. People who have mm. reached, like most of the people in my system are 40, 50, 60 years old who've been lifelong martial artists who go, there. this is what's been missing in what I want my expression to be. Had you met me in, in the heyday of your craziness, you, you just would have been sitting there like this going, I'll fuck that guy up. And I'm not interested in anything he has to say because you you had become a predator mm. and now you've evolved you said look i'm turning into the guy that i was actually afraid of fighting and now you were able to and i'm, I'm very uh, grateful for that reel that in and now you can become a true coach and mentor mentor to people and go you don't need to go down that path to be able to protect yourself or your family yeah. that just happened to be, that just happened to be uh you know your journey so um, I don't know that you and Lee and some other people do scenarios at all the way we do it, uh, uh, because I don't, I don't know what you do. I've just seen demos. Um, and the, the only thing that I would, that I would, that I would share is that in a digital world, that's fucking so woke and so litigious that you, we, the stuff you got away with 10 years ago you're some you're dating somebody in jail you'll probably because you know to fight you'd be the husband but but like you just can't do what you want anymore it will yeah. when i got into fights in school nobody ever came back with a gun and shot everybody mm. like the world has gotten pretty fucking insane so we still yeah. need to know how to protect ourselves but we need to think jordan peterson be dangerous mm. but have it under control under control yeah how, how about visualization, Tony? Do, do you use visualization for personal development? Like, what, what, what are your thoughts on neuro linguistic programming and self hypnosis and things like this? 
Um, I, I haven't delved a lot into the NLP other than like like superficial. I mean, that's where the the uh, the language of pattern interrupt inspired me back in the '80s. So yeah. you know, I was a fan of Anthony Robbins, and of course, he had an NLP I'm background. Uh, and um, so, I mean, everyone visualizes. We do a lot of it. Like I, you know, we teach. Like I said earlier, uh, on Zoom, uh, four times a week for instructors, law enforcement. We have a public safety group. Uh, we have a you know people who have no training come in. People with extensive training come in. And we do a lot of visualization, but not in the, you know, eyes closed yeah, stuff. Yeah. Do I do that personally? Uh, yeah, yes and no. Uh, but it's not a, it's almost an intuitive practice when I feel like I've worn myself out or burned myself out or something shit is happening in business. And I'm like, oh, fuck, this big contract was about to happen. And I, and I fucked it didn't happen. I just spent three months and I'm like frustrated where I'll go, I'll go for a walk, a walking meditation. I got beautiful uh, trails near my home or, or go lie down and I, you know, I'll, I'll get an app on and I'm visual and I'm changing my state by visualizing. Um, uh, and I, and I'm, I, I'm coachable. So I've got a bunch of really cool apps um, mm. where I, I have enough self-awareness to recognize that I'm down on myself. And so I'll listen to an app on, you know, positive, you know, positive mindset and thinking, yeah, and it's okay. a meditation app. And it just, it just, it just, uh, you, you know, like uh, you know, over the years, I've, I've had the opportunity to train some fighters for uh, kickboxing and MMA stuff. And, mm. uh, you know, so I'm, you know, you're sitting there, you're working on them. What are you thinking now? Where are you? What do you, okay, I want you to see yourself doing this. Uh, and they're, um, you know, one of the, one of my guys who, uh, knocked a guy out 20 seconds into the first round with a jump back kick to the forehead. Yeah, I've right? heard that I, story. Couldn't, I, I couldn't be at the fight with him and he calls me. I couldn't be at the fight with him. So he had some, you know, a buddy of ours cornering him and uh, he calls me just before he's like leaving the changing room and he's fucking nervous as shit. And he's, his name was Dan. He goes, uh, he goes, Hey coach, you know, uh, I wish you were here so I could tell he's nervous. I go, I go, Dan, you don't need me here. You don't need a fucking lucky job. I said, you know, so many fighters are superstitious. So many athletes are superstitious. I, you know, I had a guy like he had he had to wear like a certain certain socks that that he wore when he won his last fight. So it's like, oh my socks! I go, dude, you could fight barefoot. Your left hook is amazing. You don't need those socks aren't helping your left hook. But if they think they are, right, it's fucking you up. So we go back to fear management, and um, I uh, so I say to Dan, I go, Dan, you don't need me there. You got this. This is all in you. And I said to him, I said, Dan, <clears throat> I've, I've seen you do things in sparring like that are insane. Like, like I, I said, do you remember that time that you round kicked me in the face in between a one, two, you fucking round kicked me in the face in between a one, two, you fucking prick. I never told you how much that hurt me, but it hurt my feelings and it hurt my head. But, you know, I told you good shot, but your timing is impeccable. But what was I doing there? I was making him visualize a moment of greatness mm. in his training. He got in on Tony, his coach. He smashed him in the head. Then I said to him, Dan, what's your favorite kick? What's your best thing? He had a jump back like, like Benny or Kitas. His jump back kick was fucking insane. You know who Benny is, Benny the Jet? I don't know if yeah, you know. yeah, 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 of course. So, uh, so then I said to him, your jump back kick is insane. I said, what would you do if you didn't fear fear? What would mm. you do in the fight if you didn't fear fear? And when I said it the first time, it was the first time I'd said it to a fighter. I said, Dan, what's your favorite movie? He goes, jump back kick. I said, so he's visualizing the jump back kick. He's visualizing mm. kick in the head. Is he Now, is it possible for him to be afraid like he was when he said, hey, coach, uh, yeah, going out for the fight. Any, 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 uh, any words? Any words of wisdom? Right there, that's mm -hmm. fear. But he's not saying I'm afraid. He's going, hey man, just wanted to high five you before. You know, hope I see you again. Like you, if I high five you and I go, I hope I see you again. Wish me luck. That's fucking fear. You're about to get in a fight. Mm -hmm. That's a joke of in case I die, give me a hug. Mm -hmm. What are you thinking about? Right. 
But do you understand how subtle this is? So I shift his paradigm in his head without doing any woo-woo stuff. And then mm -hmm. I go, then I say to him, what's, what's your fucking best move? What's your favorite move? He goes, jump back kick. Then I said, what would you do if you weren't afraid? And he said right away, what did you say? Say that again. I said, what would you do if you weren't afraid? Do that. And we got off the phone. And he called me 20 minutes later screaming, coach, I got goosebumps right now on my, on my arms. I, I, first round, we're circling. I fucking see myself jump back, kicking this guy in the face. And I just did it. I hit him. I knocked him out. Mm. One kick, first round. Isn't that insane? Yeah, you reframed his perspective. Kind of. I gave I gave him permission to win. I gave him permission to win. Listen, he could have also got dropped, but at least he was spiritually, psychologically in the fight. Yeah. You got to give yourself permission to win. You got to give yourself permission to fight. One of my favorite quotes from uh, uh, Dan Millman, who wrote The Way of the Peaceful Warrior. I don't know if you ever read that great book. Uh, he said, if you face just one opponent and you doubt yourself, you're outnumbered. You're outnumbered, yeah. So it's such a good quote. It's true, yeah. yeah. It's like uh, I've done a bit of fighting in the ring as well, and hopefully, if my, if my body says yes, I'm gonna get back into that. But it's always the same, you know. It's like if you're thinking about what your opponent is gonna do to you, you're, you're fucked. That's it. You have to start thinking what what I'm gonna do. It's all about what I'm gonna do to him, and not the other way around. As soon as as soon as there is this this predator prey like role reversal. If you're on the wrong wrong end of that, you, you, that's it. We're, we're just fucked, isn't it? Yeah. So, yeah. what any other what any other practices do you use as tool for personal development? Do you, do you, do you do any type of internal work like slow movement, like Tai Chi and Qigong? You mentioned meditation, uh -huh. breath work. So I, I I I meditate almost every day. I I do deliberate breathing almost every day. I do nerve yeah. flossing every day. Uh, uh, stuff from my posture, you know, you know, 40, 50 years internally rotated, uh, you know, fucks up your shoulders, your low back and your neck. So all of you listening to this, you are all aging athletes. That's that 90 day transformation thing that we do. It's 90 days online. It's a pretty cool program. Uh, hit me up if you're interested in learning more about it, but what it is, it's, it's, it's 10 things that you want to do every day, meditate, breathe, water, reading, uh, there's interaction. There's live talks with me once a week. It's pretty cool. But the purpose of it is things I wish somebody had taught me 30 years ago, right? Like things that I've learned and I go, oh. so, you know, I, I try to walk every day. Walking is amazing uh, um, for you. Um, uh, and then there's daily practice. So a lot of my self-defense stuff is really about keeping the neural patterns of protective movement uh uh, uh, honed and and in your metaphoric short-term memory. And what I mean by that is uh, if I ask you what you had for breakfast today, you'll remember. If I ask what you had for breakfast two days ago, you got to go to this. You'll go, oh, yesterday I got to do this. Uh, and then if I say, well, what about, what about last week on Sunday? Now you're doing this. Sunday, Sunday, I went to brunch with my friend. So the further back in your mind you need to go, the longer the gap time is between stimulus response. So if you haven't practiced countering a sudden ambush, because you go through, let's say you go through a uh, like a Tai Chi phase and you do that for like six months, you're doing your Tai Chi and something happens, your, your brain's nervous system ha has to go back into its, its memory bank and go, boom, what do we do here? Uh, and it's an exaggeration, but it's like just understanding as a metaphor, because this is an actual long-term memory versus short-term memory. Mm. And uh, mm. so I do every day some little thing recognizing that all fights are dangerous, but the most dangerous fight is an ambush. And you can mm. never be ready for an ambush in the literal sense. That's why it's called an ambush. So I want my ability to cover my head, push away danger, deploy that airbag, and jump on this motherfucker really fast. So I'll work on that stuff. And, but you can't do that with a cortisol adrenaline dump every day. So mm. we have almost a Tai Chi version of our spear system that we flow through. And 
you know, I do that four times a week, which is enough for because I teach four times a week. So we run it through the classes. Um, there's certain calisthenic things that I do every every week. You know, I'm, I'm 63. I want to maintain my muscle mass, mass and my strength. Um, but I tell you, man, um, getting old isn't fun. <laughs> so all of you out there, work on your prehab so you're not working on your rehab. You understand yeah. that? Like, like yeah. I didn't grow up with lacrosse balls and, and, and foam rollers. It was let's go light, man. We're going to fucking beat the shit out of each other. And, and you know, you just started. You just went. It wasn't, uh, you know, you, you, you didn't go slow and warm up. So, you know, mm. I pay the price now. So I'm trying to share with a younger generation things that I wish I had done differently. Yeah, that's that's one thing. The body is something is the machine. We need to look after it because once once it starts getting fucked, it's very difficult to repair. Well, what is your experience with spirituality? I mean, spirituality means something different to every one of us. But I've had some pretty full blown like epiphany with with plant medicine. Is that something you've, you've ever dabbed into? Not in a way to really you know, have a, have an intelligent conversation about it. Um, the, uh, so I've never done any, any of, any of those, uh, um, experiences that you alluded to earlier. My, my, my spirituality is it, like, it's just ongoing, just trying to be a better human, just trying to cultivate better self-awareness. You know, the yeah. meditation, yeah. the breathing, uh, brings, uh, insights. I'll watch things and, and understand, how another person's lack of self-awareness or fear is responsible for their behavior right now. It doesn't mean I don't want to smack them or yell at them, but maybe I won't smack them or yell at them. And that's just being more spiritual and letting people, letting people uh, be, you know, you still see it. It's like I said to you, you know, before your daughter was born, like someone could look at you sideways and you punch them in the face. Then your daughter's born. She might not even be with you. Somebody looks at you sideways. You get angry, but you don't punch them in the face because you don't want to be in jail. Mm -hmm. Then you're carrying your daughter and someone looks at you sideways and you just know you notice it. And now you're just, you know, it, now you're just expanding your peripheral vision and want look, checking that mirror, checking that. They're not following you. You're safe. Fuck the world sucks. You know, but I got to protect my daughter. Now you're your, your daughter. Mm -hmm. So it, so that to me is also spirituality and it's and it's defined differently than other people. Um, I don't know if I believe in a, in a benevolent God. I know that I make fun of that. I'm more of an atheist, but I know when something shit happens and I'm worried about, you know, when my mom was dying, I remember thinking, doing this, going, oh, please, God, please, I don't. And suddenly I'm praying to God, even though I don't believe in him, right? So mm -hmm. it's, it's uh, you know, so then I think about that. I go, huh, right? So I don't, it's not a conversation that I, because it's so, it's almost like, are you a liberal or are you a conservative? Are you a Republican yeah, or, yeah. you know, are, are you, you know, did you get jabbed? Did you not get jabbed? You know, yeah, it's so, yeah. it's so, uh, it, 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 it's so polarizing for many. No, I get, I get that. I get that. Did, did, did you have any, any big moment of epiphany or any big shift in your life that made you really radically change yourself in a matter of a, of a day? Um, yeah, uh, you know, I had a neck injury, a uh, really bad neck injury that, that, that damaged a bunch of nerves in my face and my neck. Uh, and, and it, it, it triggered, um, wicked anxiety because it would put pressure on my vagus nerve. So it became, mm. it was a, it was a mechanically induced anxiety. I'd never had anxiety in my life. It was actually breathing and meditation that saved me because, oh, because I could be yeah. driving and do this to my head, you know, as a fighter, we're always, you know, you, how many times you've been punched in the face or kicked in the head. So there's times where we're just also we're just, you know, snap our neck. And if I did it and because of the hypermobility in my neck, it could slip, put pressure on my vagus nerve. Well, if you know your vagus nerve is responsible for so much in your body, next thing I know, it would just throw my nervous system into whack, go into a sympathetic state where I'd have to literally pull out of, uh, and get out of the car and go holy shit right just it was just insane but my life changed so quickly from the result of that neck injury that um mm. i couldn't run my business i couldn't teach and and i realized that uh 
my obsession with making other people safe had almost ruined my life. Mm. And I stepped back and it was like, you know, like all the nerves on my left side of my body were, were fucking dead. Uh, uh, I couldn't smile. I couldn't kiss my wife. I couldn't, it was awful. And uh, I couldn't talk properly. Uh, it, it, and it took, it took a couple years to almost get back to normal. And um, so it's something you think about it's just how, you know, how fast that, how fast that can happen. Mm. And it just, it was, it was humbling because I couldn't, the, the thing I love to do the most is to coach and teach. Mm. But all of a sudden, I, I, I couldn't even talk. I, the mm. muscles in my face, I couldn't articulate. Right? I couldn't say the word articulate, right? And so uh, so you got anxiety and you can't talk and your, your job is to coach. And you love coaching and talking and helping people. And it was all just like that taken away. So that was, mm. you know, I've had bad shit happen uh, in, in my life. I had... Uh, you know, I was running, my company was doing $12 million a year in 2010 and I had a hostile takeover, lost my company, dissolved it. And then four of my trainers fucked off and ripped me off, ripped off our high gear, ripped off our system, started talking shit about me. Uh, and I had mentored these guys. I had loaned some of the money I had, and it was such a betrayal, like it was devastating. And it took me five years to rebuild stuff. You know, and they all, you know, had their own stories of why they did it and all they did it. And I just say, like, if you were smarter than me, then why is what you're doing a fucking mirror copy of what I'm doing? Like, mm. if, it, if if you had better idea, because one of the stories was, uh, oh, we wanted to evolve, but Tony wouldn't change. He's a control freak. And I'm like, well, well, if that's the case, then why did you copy the best of my work? Just mm. you change the name. Or you're still moving or the gear looks exactly the same it's just a different color or your your drill is named differently but it's our ballistic microfight drill so you know uh and and shit like that happens because of fear and ego uh but my point being is that happened to me and i was so sad by that i wasn't I, I also angry because i was betrayed by these people who who like i had meant nobody would know who they were if it weren't for me they became mm. well-known because they were my instructors. Um, my point being is like, that was the biggest kick in the nuts. Mm. And, and uh, um, are you, are you, are you certifying people in your system? Do you have like a train the trainer program? Mm, not yet. Maybe in the future. I'm, I'm still, hey. a, I'm still a, like a relatively new, new generation of instructors. So I'm, I'm still training. Right. I'm still building my thing. So, so, so this will happen to you because it's just human nature, right? Mm. Well, whoever cuts your hair left another salon to start his own salon, right? And so there was a betrayal there. Uh, uh, whoever you go to your, if you go to a small garage for your car mechanic, that guy used to work somewhere else and he left. And maybe they're on good terms, but he, one day he said, fuck my boss is an asshole and left. Um, it happens to everybody. But what I'm sharing, spiritual, you know, you can have a spiritual epiphany in business, in relationships. Um, yep. And if, yep. and if you don't understand that, and it was interesting, you know, when the last guy who ripped me off in 2010, I called my buddy, Tim Larkin, who I knew had a bunch of like a training team around him. And I said, Tim, I, uh, how do you deal with this? And it was very interesting what he said. He said, whenever I certify new instructors, I know that one or two of them are going to fuck me in two years, three years, five years, 10 years. And I try to guess who it is. And if I'm right or wrong, I go, yeah, that's the guy. So it's not emotional to me. I expect it to happen. Mm. And I'd never, again, like, like somebody teaching you early about fear or teaching you early about startle flinch, you, um, no one had ever taught that to me. So I was like, you know, I remember like one guy is, is uh, who, who ripped me off really bad. Like I lent him, I think, six or seven or eight grand. His mom was in a hurricane and had lost everything. And he was so upset. I took money. I said, here, take this money. Give it to your mother. Like I like like these some of these people had keys to my house, hung out with my kids. I would take them on vacation for them to do this. 
blew my mind. But I realized, you know what? Something when I was working on the set of Rocky, uh, 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 this is an interesting spiritual uh, moment. Uh, of course, everyone knows who Stallone is. Well, I got to walk, work on Rocky Three. Uh, sorry, Rocky Five. I worked on Rocky Five, uh, and uh, was was coaching and working with Tommy Morrison, uh, who's a, a legit heavyweight fighter. Got to meet and hang out with Stallone. And when I was hanging out with him, Stallone had this pendant around his neck, and it had the initials DTA. And I asked him one day, I said, "What does DTA mean?" He said, "Don't trust anyone." And I was like, mm. holy shit. And I remember thinking, that's my next fucking tattoo. Because uh, I'd been betrayed at this, at the, you know, uh, the, um, uh, I'd had these problems with these different martial arts types. And, um, and I remember I've got a, a tattoo on my leg that, and it doesn't say DTA, but that's what it was going to be. And I, mm. I got it in, in 2010 after all this shit happened. And I said, I'm getting DTA. And as the guy had put this, the, the tattoo on my leg, we looked at it. He started to go, zzz, starting to go, stop. I can't do it. He goes, why? He says, DTA, that's cool, man. The story, where you got it from is cool, from Stallone. Don't trust anyone. And I said, I don't want to live like that. I can't. Mm. I'm a romantic. I'm a coach. I don't want to walk around going, don't trust your kids. Don't trust your wife. Don't trust anybody. And I had to change it to DTE. Don't trust everybody. And yeah, that's yeah, the mistake yeah. I made, Julian. I was trusting everybody. I tr and every one of those guys that, that, and this is the, like, circles back to Tim Larkin. He said he would certify people and there's a tell, like in a poker game. Yeah. There's yeah. certain things you see. And he said, I would try and guess who that person would be. So, so I don't I hope I'm not boring you and your listeners, uh, cause it's business education for everybody on here. If you're an instructor, listen to the stuff and try and figure out the lesson is the three people that really screwed me had, had had multiple times that I talked to them and I said, Hey guys, like when you use one of the, the maxims from the system, quote the system, say spear system, or as coach Blower likes to say, we want to brand right. the system. You didn't say it, but you presented it like it's your system. Mm. And if we're going to grow this, we need it to be about the system. You know, so if and you, if you listen to me in any one of my seminars, I quote multiple people throughout it. Mm. And so there, there, there was this one guy from UK who, who shared with me this PowerPoint he was doing, and he quotes... Uh, Bruce Siddle, who's a famous researcher, he quotes, uh, uh, oh, fuck, uh, uh, he probably quoted Boyd on the OODA loop. He quoted... Oh, John, oh, no, John Boyd, yeah. Yeah, he quoted John Boyd. He, he, uh, but he also quoted Bruce Siddle, uh, and he quoted, uh, who's the guy that wrote On on Killing? Uh, Lieutenant Colonel... Um, oh, Grossman. Grossman. So Dave, Bro he quotes Grossman. And then there's a bunch of slides that are, are my quotes, but no name. And I said to him, dude, why did you quote everyone else but me? Mm. And he goes, oh, I'll fix that. Two guys from the Netherlands did that, this guy from the U. And I would look at them and I'd look. So if you were an FBI negotiator, you'd go, mm. that's one of the guys that's going to fuck you. Because he quoted three people, but not you. But now he's doing a presentation. But what I did, mm. I got offended and I said, why, why wouldn't you, you know, it, like, like one of my quotes is, is, is uh, or I mean, I'm not going to mention, but like there's a zillion of my quotes, right? Like I, I work, I spend a lot of time trying to create things that are easy to memorize that, that way they're memorable. And, and you'll go, you'll think about it in the street or when you're training. Oh yeah. Those who talk can usually be persuaded to walk. Okay. This is a time for deescalate. And so I see this in a presentation and I go, why are you doing that? And they go, I'll fix it. And my, my intuition goes, fuck. But the romantic coach in me goes, okay, cool. You're like, just remember that, man. Dan Millman said, right? Right, <laughs> just do the quote. And yeah. the lesson that I learned too late in life is that your intuition never lies. Listen mm -hmm. to this, Julian. Everyone on this call, if you're still here, we've been on quite a while. 
every victim of violence who I've interviewed, every single one of them, said they had a bad feeling before the attack. Mm. Their intuition yeah. said something's wrong here. Every single one of them, 100% of them. So if your intuition's telling you, what, but what most people do is they put blinders on. They go, oh, no, this can't be happening to me. Cognitive mm. dissonance, uh, or i got to get home mm. fast, or they're in a bubble, they're on their phone, they're not paying attention. And then just before something happens. So all of these guys that fucked off had had multiple meetings with me as their CEO going, you didn't do this, you didn't do this, I need you to do this, come on. And they were all pre-con... What would be a pre-contact cue for you and I in a street fight? These were pre-contact mm -hmm. cues for betrayal. Yeah. But I didn't have the courage to fire them because I'm a poet at heart. I was saddened by it, and I figured that I could remediate. And so now, and I'll give you like, so the lesson for everyone here is if you've got a bad feeling about someone, it doesn't have to be danger. Just something's a little bit off. Mm. Address it then. And it can be a, a, like a, like a, like a, a, just an honest con conversation. If I, if, I, if I walked into your room and I said, hey, man, my wallet's missing. Mm. I need to check you. You might go, like, like, if you didn't steal my wallet, you might say, check me, man, I got nothing to hide. Or you might say, that's really offends me. And we're done if that's how you are. But fucking check me, right? It could go either way. Mm. But if you did steal my wallet, your behavior is going to be very specific. Yeah. Right? What are you talking about, man? I've heard this is bullshit. Like, there'll be something off because mm. you've got my wallet on you. So I had a guy, I was out in uh, uh, years ago, where I still live in Canada, and I was out in uh, um, Valencia, California, where Black Belt Magazine was at the time. And I bump into a guy in the, in the bookstore, goes, oh, my God, are you Tony Blower? And I go, yeah. And he goes, I'm signing up for your cert, man. I can't believe I bumped into you. Can I get a picture? I'm like, yeah, sure. Anyway, dude, we'll take a picture. He goes, uh, so we start chit-chatting in this bookstore. And he goes, oh, I fucking can't believe it. He goes, look, I've been a fan of yours for a long time. I want to get certified. I can't wait to, to learn some of your material and then put my spin on it. Mm. And uh, I looked at him and I go, let me ask you something. If this were not martial arts, but this was a job interview, and I was the guy interviewing you. And I said, why do you want to come into my company? And you said, because I want to learn your systems and then put my spin on it. Would I hire you? Mm. He goes, what? I go, I wouldn't hire you because I don't want you to change my systems. I don't want you to put your spin on my algorithm or my accounting system. I want you, if you can think of a better way to improve it, I'd want you to put your hand up and go, hey, what would happen if we did this? And then we could have that discussion but I wouldn't want you thinking about putting your spin on it. And he got really defensive. And, but I didn't let him apply. I said, don't bother applying. You can't come in. Because what I recognized immediately was here's somebody who hasn't even done the course and is already putting his spin on it. Mm. If you trained with me as, as, a, as a lifelong martial artist and said, I want to go through it for real, and experience it and then and then see if i can improve my system uh from this if i can see if i can improve my system or if i can if i if i uh, uh or if there's something that uh whatever it is it could be one move it could be two move it could be a whole block you might do our de-escalation de thing and go, oh my god like this is this whole block needs to be in my scenario program it's going to be level two because I want them to go through my level one. But this just expanded our menu of options. You can't do that if you're thinking about manipulating it before experiencing it. Yeah. Right? Does that make sense? Like, like yeah, yeah, of course, man. So, so like, that's the lesson. You know, it took me 30, 30 years to get to the point where if I'm reading an application essay or I'm interviewing something and I go... Like, I'll go, hey, man, sorry, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, um, yeah. So all of that, I know I went off on a tangent there, uh, but the um, but the message here is there's, there's an article I wrote in my Substack feed that people should read called Accidental Mentors. That's the name of it. And the, the, okay. the, the, concept, behind, behind, the concept behind, if you just Google Tony Blower, Accidental Mentor, 
Substack, it should pop up at the internet. But um, it's it's this idea that anybody can be a spiritual guide to you if you've got good self awareness and you go, you know, I, I was in a, 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 a cab leaving a military installation in Australia and it's a very specific unit that trains there and this cabbie picks me up and uh, as soon as he hears me speaking English he goes oh, you're not from around here well, you know uh, what do you do mate and I said to him if I tell you I gotta kill you I was making a joke of where I was and but because you're driving if I kill you then I might die too so we had a good laugh and he says mm. uh, no so like I don't mean who you're working with I mean what do you do so we start talking that I, I teach a very specific brand of uh, mindset, fear management, and scenario-based training, weaponizing the start of flinch. And uh, he says, oh, is it like Krav Maga? Is it like this? A martial I said, no, it's about understanding the human weapon system so that anybody who, if you love boxing or Krav or jujitsu or anything, it can make you safer because you understand the operating system. You understand who you are, what's underneath everything. And he goes, how long have you been doing that? And at the time, this is about five years ago, you know, so let's say I, I said, you know, uh, 50 years. So I said, I've been doing that for 50 years. He goes, what do you mean? How old are you? I said, I'm I'm uh, 57 or 58 at the time. I said about 50 years. He goes, he goes, hold on a shit. Like, uh, you've been like, doing, yeah, I mean, this is all I've ever done. I've been teaching since 1977. So, you know, that's 43 years at the, at the time. It wasn't, it wasn't the same, the same, uh, whatever five years back was. And uh, mm. he goes, you didn't have any other jobs. I said, no. You know, I went to school. I dropped out of school. I worked for my dad for a little bit. But even when I was working for my dad, I was teaching self-defense at night. And he says, mm. he says, I don't know anyone else that's done the same thing for 40 or 50 years. Everyone has different jobs. And some people might find this, but then they have, a different job in that company. They may be at the same company for 30 years or retire, but they started off in the mail and then they hear, then they became the manager and then they became VP of this. And then they bought the company. And it had never occurred to me ever once that what I love is also what people pay me to do. That mm. rare, 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 you know, uh, uh, situation where, I mean, I don't teach people I don't want to teach anymore. That was a spiritual yeah. bit, right? But just the, and it's not luck, you know, it's not luck. A lot of, I get, I run another article, it's in Substack, you know, I, you know, would you rather be lucky or good? Um, mm. Where where people go, oh, you're so lucky. Blower's so lucky. Blower's just a good marketer. Like the teams that I, that, that pay me to train them aren't stupid, right? They mm. vet people. They research. It's referral. You know, you, you don't you don't get to train some of the entities that I have because of luck or good marketing. And and uh, but I wrote this article on luck. You know, you know, luck is when you planned an outdoor seminar and it's sunny and not raining. Mm -hmm. That's luck, mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Well, you know, and, and so, you know, I tell people, like, would you rather be lucky or good? And a lot of people go, I'd rather be lucky. I go, no. You know, you know, the, the old maxim, the harder you practice, the luckier you get. It's not luck. It's fucking, it's deliberate. It's something I read the other day last week. This is an example of accidental mentor. Some people who are still on because they're, I hope people are working and they're not on for two hours or two and a half hours. This is turning into like a Joe Rogan podcast. You know, we're just. Yeah, but that's, that's what I do, man. Some of my podcasts are like three and a half hours, man. <laughs> yeah, it's wild. Um, the, uh, you know, the accidental mentor concept is this idea that you can bump into a taxi driver who makes you think about your life differently. That's the that's the that's the point of the story, you know, that when I got out of that car from him, I went and sat down and just meditated and thought, holy shit, I need to be more grateful. I need to be thinking about the opportunities that are presented because of the hard work. You know, like last week, uh, um, I wrote something because I just read uh, a quote um, from from this this guy Zach uh, Porgo. I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right, but it was a part of a whole sequence where he said, "Succeed on purpose." And that mm. one line blew my mind. I wrote this fucking two page article 
to these people that I'm mentoring all about, we need to succeed on purpose. We need to win on purpose. It can't be a fucking accident. It's got to be, it's got to be like, that was the foregone conclusion. And if we lose, it's a surprise to us. Mm. We hadn't considered it, that we're succeeding on purpose. And when you want to succeed on purpose, that's very calculated. That means like if you get back into fighting and you want to succeed on purpose, you're going to study the film of your, of your opponent. You're going to research the rules of that uh, uh, association so you don't get disqualified and you take advantage of everything you can. You're going to analyze. You know, I had a fighter once who my fighters were always responsible for their road work. I hated running, so I didn't run with them. I'd say, I want you doing this. One of the fights in the second, after the first round, the guy's sitting there going, <laughs> and I looked at him in the second round and I said, you didn't fucking do your road work like you told me, did you? And he looks up and I go, don't lie to your fucking coach. You're on your own the next two, you're on your own the next two rounds. I'm here to fucking squirt water in your mouth, but no strategy is going to help you, motherfucker, because you can't fake endurance in a fight. Mm. Right? Talk about tough love. Right. But it was like, like, what was I going to say to him? You got it. You're OK. Just stay this up. You're you're so gassed. You can't keep your hands up. Because you lied to me. Right. You think that was a wake up call for him? Mm. So um, the whole accidental mentor, this idea succeed on purpose. But these are all business insights, the business of your life. Right. Mm. And they apply to relationships. They apply to your your entrepreneurship. And they sure as shit apply to managing violence. Hmm. That, that, that's interesting. That's all interesting stuff. You know, you realize that all this is universal. Those, those strategies are universal. When you find strategies that works with everything, it works in combat, it works with violence, it works in business, works in relationships. I, li I yeah. like that. I like, you know, I, I like this, this type of approach where you got like one size t-shirt that fits all, that fits everyone. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because this is universal. This is going to work for everyone. Yeah, no, that is that is cool stuff. Let me ask you Thank something, you. Tom. Did you have any experience that you could not explain in a rational manner? Like like, like an out-of-body experience or some shit like that, you mean? For, ex for example, yeah. Um, I've had some weird shit happen, but I don't remember them to talk about them. I can remember... I remember uh, like a couple of things happening. I remember getting lost as a little kid before I'd started self-defense, getting lost as a little kid. And um, uh, I was with a friend and we came down this hill and then all of a sudden, like a little shack, a little like, like log cabin appeared. And we both got so scared at the same time. We ran and... It was almost like it wasn't one of those things where you're like, what's that? And you're experimenting and you're in there and like a cat runs out and you run away. It was like this, this, this energy of fucking danger and evil that both of us felt at the exact same time. And we ran. But I remember then thinking there was definitely a dead body in that house or there was somebody who, that was prepared to kill you in that place because yeah. it like appeared out of nowhere. It was so camouflaged and it was like, and that's like a goofy one because, but it was one of those things where like it, it told me, even though I didn't heed the lesson, uh, trust your intuition, trust your instincts. Um, mm -hmm. I, I've had, you know, uh, crazy dreams where like, they're so vivid. You, you, you just know something's happening or is going to happen, but nothing that I, Nothing that I like I wrote down and studied and went when I saw this, I knew that. Um, um, yeah, so nothing, nothing really interesting or exciting to but I but I all of that to say that that I I believe there's way more to the world than us. I just mm. don't know what that is yet. Yeah. Okay, let, let let's wrap up with two questions that I ask everyone uh, at the end of the interview. If you had like a thousand Kids in front of you, like younger generation, what's your best advice for younger generations? I would tell all of them that 
you can't be brave if you're not afraid that the primary ingredient of courage is fear and that your parents, your gym teacher, your coaches, your mentors probably won't explain this notion of fear as simply as this, that it's okay to be afraid and still do the things you need to do in life. That when you manage your fear, you manage your time. And time is the only resource we can't get back. And the longer you spend afraid, the less you do in your life. The longer it takes you to do stuff. So if you want to manage time, you need to manage fear. And, and I would get them thinking about that idea that there are things you need to do afraid in life. Think about how many things we avoided, procrastinated on, didn't do because we were afraid to say this to our boss or a loved one, or, you know, it could be like three days that you're not talking to somebody because you're angry. And then you finally have a fight and then you find out you misunderstood each other or you make up, but you can never get those three days back. Mm. And you mm. could say, well, it was because I was angry. And if you peel the onion, it's no, because you were afraid. You were afraid to have the conversation. So, I mean, that's just my take, but I would, I know that that one of my missions right now is where I work a lot with coaches and parents sharing the no fear program, because I know that the future of the world is in the hands of a bunch of kids that are being manipulated. And if, if we can't teach the next younger generation how to manage fear, they will not have any critical thinking skills. Managing fear improves your self-awareness self-awareness improves your critical thinking skills so when mm -hmm. the government or big pharma or the mainstream media says oh look you need to be afraid of this mm -hmm. you go yeah i am afraid of what they just said but i'm going to manage my fear and do my own research holy mm -hmm. shit getting a free donut doesn't add up here getting put in a lottery if i do this that doesn't add up here i'm going to dig a little deeper uh, and uh, hold off. So fear management improves self-awareness. Self-awareness improves critical thinking, and the world fucking needs critical thinking right now. You're, you're right about that, man. <laughs> you're right about a lot of things, man. Um, tell you what, last question, which should have been the one before. That that was supposed to be the last question. That's but okay. If you could go back in the past and do something differently, what would it be? Or would you, would you at all? <laughs> yeah. Uh, honest, honestly, if there was no money in the world and there was no food in the world, meaning like food was just abundant and nobody, you could just have whatever you thought about. But violence was still there. I'd still be doing what I'm doing. Yeah. What I would change is what I'm doing in a, what's called our BTS 90 program, Built to Survive 90. That's that 90 day transformation. Uh, mm -hmm. We had a cop in that. And I'll, I'll, I'll get to this. I, it sounds like I'm shamelessly plugging this, but it's something I wish I'd started a long time ago. We had a cop in it named Randy Linder. He's uh, the lead defensive tactics instructor in uh, uh, a district in, uh, in uh, Louisiana, very violent area, lots mm -hmm. of gun crime. Um, he just lost 37 pounds in less than three months. This is not a weight loss program. The program changed his mindset that he got back in shape. He started doing the training. He started doing these daily practices and lost 37 pounds. He was one of the guys that flew here this weekend. I didn't even fucking recognize him. Why am I bringing that up is because he joined it. He's much younger than me. Uh, um, but it was this. I said, I'm an aging athlete. I live in so much pain every day, nerve pain, back pain, neck pain. That if I don't do these 10 things every day, tomorrow is worse. Yeah. And I wish I'd been doing them when I was 30 because I would not be living like I am. I wish I was doing them when I was 40 or 50. I said, you guys have a chance to learn from me. I'm not some, I'm not smarter than you. I'm not better than you. I didn't, I just have, I, one of my gifts is the ability to explain, to articulate an efficient way to get something done an efficient way to manage fear, an efficient way to weaponize the, the, the start of flinch, an efficient way to run a scenario so that the outcome is that you are safer at the end of the training. 
and uh, or the experience. So coming back full circle, I needed to tell this story with this guy. I got a letter from him that said the new academy started. He said, I went and put on my uniform. I pulled my pants up and went to grab my jacket and my pants fell down. I had lost so much weight. I didn't realize my pants, I didn't use the need to cinch my belt before I grabbed my fucking dress shirt, my jacket. And he can't, he said, I cannot tell you how, and this is the thing, Julian, he said, it's changed my relationship with my wife, losing weight and seeing me change again, changed my mood, my energy. People aren't recognizing me. Like, that's the thing. You know, uh, the fact that he's still a cop and he's in danger every day doing his job and he's more competent and confident, but it's from the inside. It wasn't about, oh, he learned a new way to, to do an elbow. It was a mm. new way to manage your daily uh, uh, routine that facilitates more a better emotional, psychological, physical posture. So you're standing tall as a good human. So if I could go back in time, I would, number one, find somebody that could, that could have, you know, explained to me how to manage fear at a young age. Mm. That would have changed my life. And, and somebody would say, look, no matter what, do this shit every day. Yeah. Right? It'll, it'll you know, it, our body's the only thing we, we have with us forever, right? Like people come mm. and go, your body's with you forever. Learn to take mm. care of it. True. Well, listen, Tony, that was super insightful. Um, I, I tell you what, if you have a website, if you have courses, DVDs, just throw it all out, throw it all out here on, on here. You can do that, man. That's what it's here for as well. Okay. Um, yeah. Right, can we do it after? Like the, the links I can put live, or you want me to do that now? Yeah, that we, can do, we can do both. I mean, you can just let us know what's your website. If you got any yeah. upcoming seminars, any courses that you sell, just just go ahead. I'll, I'll, I'll have my team send you all, all the, the, uh, the information. Guys, if you're still listening, you know, my main website is blauertrainingsystems.com, B-L-A-U-E-R trainingsystems.com. It'll take you to our high, our high gear page, all our spear courses, uh, and my no fear stuff. You know, if the fear management stuff was interesting, go to no fear now, K-N-O-W, fear now, one word, dot com. Um, uh, if our, our train the trainer course is of interest to you, there's links there. Go to our training calendar, find out how to get involved. You know, uh, we've got stuff like our online stuff. We've got, we got tons of stuff. Uh, uh, most of the people who train with me have a lot of experience who listen to me with an open mind and go, huh. This guy can time collapse, meaning I can turn a decade into a couple of days, give you the formula, the tools, and then you're 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 off and running. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I hope you enjoyed it. I appreciate the opportunity to share our stuff to hopefully a new audience, a younger generation, and uh, you know, here to serve, here to help. Well, I I, I really enjoyed it. It was great. Uh, so. Ladies, gentlemen, if you want to see this podcast again, if you want to share it, you can go on uh, my YouTube channel in the live section, uh, which is Adrenaline Combatives. Uh, it's going to be there. So share it widely, spread the love, and uh, we'll see you next time. Tony, I'll just, I'll just uh, press the button so that we're not live anymore, and I'll have a, little, I'll have a two-minute chat with you before I go, if that's For okay. Sure. Yeah. No problem. Guys, see you later.